I'll call the roll. I'm gonna. Oh, sorry, Veronica Amador. I'm gonna promote as a panelist. Thank you, uh, Barbara Marshman. Here. Christina Johnson. Here. Elizabeth Monley. Ellie Matsumura. Enrico Calendar. Frank Maitsky. Here. Eric Percival. Here. George Sanchez. Present. Hui Tran. Here. Jeremy Barus. Jose Posada. Lund Diep. Present. 
Linda Lazat. Luis Barosio. Here. Magnolia Siegel. Present. Maria Fuentes. Here. Sammy Robledo. Sherry Segura. T. Tran. Tobin Gilman. Here. Veronica Amador. Here. Yong Zhao. Frederick Ferrer. You have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is no public record, so we'll move on. Up next is the consent calendar. Is there any member of the public who would like to address the consent calendar? Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tessa Woodmancy, uh, the consent calendar. Well, I'm just not happy with what I'm hearing about the whole process of this Charter Review Commission. And, you know, when we have our most critical issue, which is our climate crisis, and that it's not being addressed, and it's the people's, you know, the part of the, um, our charter review, and, you know, maybe it's in, in the, you know, anyway, I just, we really need to be dealing with that as we are, you know, in the jaws of destruction. And, you know, everything is, you know, coming true. All the science is coming true much faster than we ever thought. It's now. Climate change is now. We're seeing, like, like um, Gavin Newsom Recording in Gavin progress. Newsom was saying that, you know, if you don't believe the science, just look with your eyes. And, you know, also, you know, just knowing what's happening around our country where 17 inches of... Um, uh, of rain in 24 hours and 30 degree abnormality of, of heat. Uh, and this is off the scale. And so we have no idea what, you know, everything looks good out there, but the climate change means that it's not going to look the way it looks right now. And we have to get ready because it's going to extremely change is what we're seeing around the nation, around the world. And so, you know, to say that, you know, and the reason why it's not being given the, 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 the you know, a fair shrift in our in our governance review is because th and that's why we're in the world of hurt we're in is that it's not you know we're not putting it we're looking at gross domestic product we're looking at politics and economics and we have to start looking at our, our physics and engineering and you know which is that's all we should be talking about is how we're going to engineer the solutions for the future and we're not doing that and we need to for our survival and the survival of the, all, you know, the other earthlings that are coming down the track of extinction with us. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for the uh, meeting on uh, July 29th, the public hearing uh, that uh, you're approving today, the minutes. Um, you know, the, the, the public hearings are a way, I think I'm understanding that, um, uh, what you talk about in subcommittee in the subcommittee process that can then come out in the public hearing, which which is uh, works fairly well, and you offer some interesting descriptions within uh, you know the public hearing setting, what to expect of the meeting, and what you've been talking about in the subcommittee process. It's my uh, very much my hope that uh, there can be that extra step uh, in that that everyday public can get an idea of what exactly was talked about at the subcommittee meetings. And I think that's through at least uh, having recorded agenda meeting minutes and having the audio available. And if not, having a very good uh, minutes, detailed minutes process uh, recorded by the secretary of the meeting and, and being that those minutes can be available to the public. I, I just think it can help a lot. Um, we're getting good descriptions, but not as good as they can be, and not up to date, up to the minute. Uh, so I hope you can work on meeting minutes uh, on, at subcommittees, and that's how we can, you know, compromise on what can be the future of good public practices for the subcommittee process, and allow us more of the community to be involved. 
Um, thank you. Uh, you know, there's always a serious debate with 27 sec sec seconds here that um, about uh, agenda minutes, uh, if you're approving them, if public comment is a part of those meeting minute agendas and that you're approving. I feel they are. Some do not. Some feel it's just the items themselves. I once again mention the ideas of natural disaster preparedness for the Bay Area in the next few years and decade. Just to remind yourselves of that, whatever we need to do. Thank you. Jeffrey Buchanan. Um, members of the commission, I, uh, Jeff Buchanan on behalf of Working Partnerships USA and the uh, Silicon Valley Rising Coalition. Um, would uh, certainly thank you to the commission for its uh, continued work on, on issues of, of governance. Um, appreciated both the, uh, the public hearing uh, and your most recent meeting discussing these issues. I uh, wanted to raise up a, a particular comment um, from a commissioner that I, I, I think uh, is worth exploring more as, as the commission uh, moves towards making its recommendations to, uh, to the city council. I believe it was uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Maitsky uh, who had made the, uh, the comment that, you know, given the wide support uh, for moving the mayoral election to presidential years, uh, and given the large number of topics uh, still to be covered uh, in terms of uh, discussions amongst uh, the commission, uh, perhaps it may make sense to think about uh, forwarding that particular recommendation to council early uh, before the commission uh, uh, completes its work on the many other important issues before it. Um, so we'd, we'd like to encourage, you know, given, you know, certainly appreciated the wide support. I think there was only one uh, vote against uh, provisionally supporting that recommendation. And I think we heard a number of, of strong comments from, uh, from all, all, all parts of the commission and of why we should be thinking about uh, moving forward overall with this proposal, but would encourage the, the, the commission to think about uh, perhaps what would it mean to uh, bring forward that recommendation where we have such wide support uh, earlier in the process, uh, particularly given the implications of that measure to uh, the, the, the soon to be uh, begun process about thinking about who, uh, the, the mayoral uh, campaign that's gonna start in 2022. Uh, I've heard from, from, from some that, you know, perhaps it would make sense uh, for the public to be aware of this earlier rather than later. Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe Boy. Jeff got his marching orders, boy. Boy, he agenda hunting like a mother. Anyways, uh, my comments are with regard to the letters to the public. Um, I've noticed that a lot of a lot of organizations and individuals they they just eviscerate the definitions of what inclusion means, of what diversity means, and what equity means. And they throw these words around. I mean, sometimes when you listen to somebody talk, I mean, they just blah, and uh, uh, DEI, 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 uh, diversion, equity, uh, uh, per persons of color, um, uh, uh, let me see, a more equitable um, uh, system so that uh, we have inclusion, so that there's diversity. And I, I mean, it gets, it gets so frustrating because if you ask the person, can you define each one of those specifically? And we have to get to a point where we can talk about race. You see, we can, and we could talk about how different people experience this city within the context of racial equity. I'll give you an example. You have Japanese, Japanese internment camps. You have the, uh, the Vietnamese, where the Vietnamese presence here in the city really is only dated up, up until 1974, 1973. They don't have the history that the Chicano does. They don't have that. They, they just don't, okay? Because it's not a part of their history here. So you can't put Chicano issues on par with Vietnamese, with Japanese, with, um, with poor whites, with, um, uh, with immigrants. These are different issues. And so if we're gonna start talking and using those terms, we need to be able to define the differing groups and what it means to them. Back to the commission. All right, thank you. Thank you to everyone who spoke. 
Um, next, would any of the commissioners like to pull the item for discussion? We're going to be approving the minutes from the public hearing on July 29th, 2021. Vice Chair Johnson, this is Jeremy Burroughs. I just want to say I'm, I'm present. I was a little late joining the meeting. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, so seeing none, um, can I get a motion, please? So moved. And this would be Commissioner Tran. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tran. Can I get a second? Second, Barbara Marshman. Thank you, Commissioner Marshman. Okay. Um, and that will be approved. Oh, I'm sorry. Can the clerk please call the roll? I'll call the roll. Barbara Marshman? Yes. Christina Johnson? Yes. Elizabeth Monley? Ellie Matsumura? Enrico Callender? Aye. Frank Maitsky? Yes. Derek Percival? Yes. George Sanchez? Yes. Lee Tran? Yes. Jeremy Bruce? Yes. Jose Posadas? Yes. Glenn Diep? Aye. Linda Lazat? Luis Brosio? Aye. Magnolia Siegel? Yes. Maria Fuentes? Yes. Sammy Robledo? Sherry Segura? Yes. T. Tran? Aye. Tobin Gilman? Yes. Veronica Amador? Yes. Yong Zhao? Yes. You, that motion passes. Thank you. Okay, um, now we have no items in our report section, so I will move to old business. Um, and before we start that, I do want to say that um, our study session will be heard at 6 p.m. today, so I just wanted to make sure folks were aware of that. Okay, next we have an old business item for a report and discussion on commission's, commission's work plan. Would the clerk or consultant have a report for us today? Yeah, I have an update on the revised work plan, if this is a good time to do it. Fantastic. Well, let me share my screen. And uh, after our last meeting, um, uh, given the direction from the commission to add four additional study sessions, uh, spoke with the city clerk and the chair to figure out how we can make that happen. And uh, this is the revised work plan, which you all received, uh, and for the public's uh, edification, this is where we landed. We're starting tonight with um, changing up our, our meeting format um, from a full commission meeting to primarily a study session. Although there will be some, although there will be some items um, of old business and new business, but uh, the bulk of tonight's meeting is around a study session on the topic of policing, and we have a number of, of guest speakers, which you'll hear be hearing from uh, starting at six. And um, that means that the governance structure uh, topics uh, and, and recommendation memos are being pushed back um, towards later in September. September 6th, we discovered, uh, we didn't catch it, was a break, uh, it's a, a holiday for the city, so the city clerk's office is out. And um, we moved the September 6th meeting, we canceled that, and we created a study session on September 9th. And we have a number of speakers in the queue. I think they're all confirmed as of today, and we'll get that information to you by the end of the week. Uh, but that uh, topic will be on equity and how to think about equity in, in a few different ways. Um, within the context of the charter. And that will start at 5.30 on the, the next regu regularly, actually added a new uh, Monday uh, on September 13th. So we added a, a meeting, a study session, and this one will be on climate change. I have a few figures uh, being uh, lined up uh, with uh, in collaboration with the uh, um, Police and Municipal Law Accountability and Inclusion Subcommittee uh, and the uh, subcommittee lead, Commissioner Siegel. And um, 
on the 17th, that becomes the new deadline for recommendations for the governance structure uh, memos. And we uh, wanted to save the September 20th meeting to hear those uh, governance structure uh, goes governance structure recommendations before the September 25th public hearing. We did cancel the August 25th public hearing because those governance structure uh, memos would not be ready um, given the, the um, extra time desired for uh, study sessions. So governance structure will be pushed back to September 20th, giving that subcommittee some extra time. Uh, and there will be, as we did for voting in elections, an opportunity for commissioners to hear the recommendations before they're presented to the public on the public hearing uh, Saturday, um, uh, the 25th at 11 a.m. 25th of September. On Monday, the 27th, there'll be another study session. This topic is um, TBD, and uh, again, collaborating with the, the uh, Policing Municipal Law Accountability Inclusion Subcommittee on that. And uh, on uh, that was an additional meeting uh, added as well. And then on the, the regularly scheduled October 4th full commission meeting, we will uh, discuss the public hearing feedback on the governance recommendations and do provisional voting on those topics. And then go into uh, discussion of policing municipal law accountability and inclusion recommendations on the 18th uh, and November 1st. So the, the deadline for those recommendations from that subcommittee would be Friday, October 29th, uh, so that we can have all of them in uh, your hands to be able to, to review before being discussed at a full commission meeting on November 1st. And then we have uh, our fourth um, and final public hearing on November 6th. Uh, it's a Saturday at 11 a.m. I believe, and I'll, I'll look to Tony to confirm this, but that we're gonna go back to in-person meetings as of October. So um, you can expect for October and November for these meetings to be in person. Uh, after this public hearing on the 4th, um, we will uh, discuss the public hearing feedback on the recommendations that were presented and then do provisional voting on them. And then we have um, an additional meeting we added on Thursday, the 18th, to basically that meeting and Monday, November 29th, to talk about the recommendations that you would like to include in a final uh, majority report and or minority report. So we have... Um, two meetings at the tail end of this to, to pull it all together. And um, the recommendations are gonna be due basically that, that following week in order to get them to prepare to get to council in time by December 14th. Tony, um, are we still planning on going in person uh, in October? Um, yeah, I haven't heard anything different. Um, it, it's all based on the governor's executive order and so far due to expire September 30th which um, that's what gives you guys the exemption from having to put your home addresses on the agenda. So yes, October um, will be in person, but we will be doing hybrid for the public. So the public can attend either in person or by Zoom, but the members of the commission will need to be in person. Great. Thank you. And that is the, the quick update on how we revised the back half of this schedule to accommodate more study time for the final subcommittee. Uh, back to you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, is there any member of the public who would like to address this old business item? Tessa Woodmancy. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tessa Woodman C. Well, uh, you know, thank you for putting climate change on the agenda for September 13th, most probably half a meeting if we're lucky. And, you know, the thing is, is that it, it, you know, we've had, you know, a whole year of dealing with politics and economics, I'm sure is, is in there. And, uh, you, know, with that, and, you know, when we're not really dealing with the elephant in the closet, which is our climate crisis and, you know, when people are saying that it's unbelievable what happened in Tennessee, 22 died and, you know, and that they were taken by surprise. They had no warning and, you know, their homes were destroyed and everything was destroyed in their, their town. And, 
You know, these are the, you know, and our, the job of our politicians is to protect us from harm. And our charter, you know, and that's not happening in our current political uh, regime because our politicians are bought and uh, by our corporations. So we need so much transformational change. And to just give it, you know, maybe half, you know, four hours or whatever amount of meeting time or, you know, less than that, most probably, because I didn't see it anywhere else. That we need a lot of time to get people up to speed about the problems and the need to have this in the charter, because that is the issue, is that we can't leave it to the politics because of their, um, you know, collusion with the corporations and keeping business as usual when we need transformational change. And so, and that's what the science says. And so, Basically, you know, we need to have more education because otherwise we'd be do doing things and we're doing nothing. Like, like Greta says, we're all, they're all the politicians are actors saying this is green, 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 and it's acting and it's no action. We, and our, our, our CO2 and our fossil fuel use is going up still. And, you know, we need to live within our budget and really understand what the budget is and really make the changes and have that in the charter. And it's going to take a lot more information a lot more education than you're giving it. El Soto? Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, the reason why I talk so much about equity and, and these, these new words that are being used, it really actually, they're, they're completely abstract. There's absolutely no way that you're gonna define it. And, and, and here's why. Last week, I, I went to this, the city auditor and this dude audits literally every single department in the city, every single one of them. He used the word equity three times within the context of the meeting, and they were lowercase. The E was lowercase. It was not uppercase. It should have been capitalized. Okay, but it wasn't. But yet he used it three times, the word. And so what I asked him was very simple. I would like you to tell me and explain to me where within the context of all these departments did you use and frame equity within the context of those policies and then and, and within the departments and then i would like you to explain to me how you balanced it what 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 was the what was the outcome of that he couldn't do it if this is a public record he could not do it he said the city does not have a working definition of what equity means so to, to sit here and say that this word is going to be used and thrown around like it's like, like this is what we're doing because we use the word, you know, we used in, in inclusion and equity and diversity. So that means that that's what we are. No. The other thing is, is using the, uh, the uh, persons of color. I'm a Chicano and the Chicano community right there in Salsi Puedes is the birthplace of three of the most powerful Mexican-American movements of the 20th century, the lowrider movement the farm workers movement and the Chicano movement. All three of them have their birthplace in that barrio where I come from. My father lived there, my mother lived there. And so to say that, that we shouldn't be acknowledged as an, as, a, as an actual entity in a community within. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, we're sometimes talking hopefully about some pretty uh intangible things, uh, equity, reimagine. And what I'm hoping we can soon be talking more about is ideas of uh, open democratic practices and civil rights and civil protection ideas. Um, you're addressing those things uh, with your subcommittee meetings and what will be the, on the upcoming agendas. Uh, thank you for that, a lot for that. I mean, it's kind of, it, these, it's these intangible things that are kind of our ideals and hopes, I think, for our next decade. And it just makes for really interesting dialogue that invites all parts of the community to ask questions and want to participate in what is our sustainable future. Um, a reminder, I don't think the ideas of development and a fast track for the mayor and, and, and large corporate uh, you know, entities is, is quite the road to sustainability that uh, we need to be addressing. You're addressing good issues. Thank you. Um, I hope I can just remind, uh, you know, you're addressing, addressing issues of the community. I hope I can just remind at this time that, um, you know, be considering uh, the future of the subcommittee process and how it can be more of a public process. How can the public be invited to the process? Whatever that could mean. Could that mean, you know, meeting minutes? Could that mean 
you know, indirect invitations uh, for, for, the, for the public, uh, just some form of, of how the public can be uh, more involved with the subcommittee process can be helpful. You have certain rules that people want to follow, but there's also, there's many rules of the Brown Act and ways to interpret the Brown Act and, and that cities around the state practice subcommittee as an as a open public process. So good luck how we can compromise on this issue. I think we need immediate up-to-date facts about how the subcommittee process works for, for good thinking. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute. Um, back to the commission. All right, thank you. Um, now is the time for commissioners to ask any questions regarding this item. Please raise your hand. All right, I don't see any hands raised. I have a quick question. Oh, yes, Louise. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, so this question is for uh, Lawrence. Lawrence, uh, really quick, I know you went through the, the uh, updated work plan. Um, a question about when we hit on the global warming topic, uh, will there be enough time to submit recommendations to the appropriate subcommittee after that, or will there not be time for that? Yeah, the, uh, the subcommittee that is taking on that topic is the, the subcommittee on policing, municipal law, uh, inclusion and accountability. So if we have those, um, that presentation on the, the 17th and, uh, excuse me, on the 13th, the, the final recommendations uh, for that subcommittee are not due until October 29th. So there's plenty of time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Cause I know we have some, some members of the public that would really want to dive into that. So just Definitely want to make sure that there's enough time to submit a recommendation if if necessary. So thank you. You bet. Thank I see you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. First, I just wanted to note that I'm here and very much apologize for running late. And also, uh, do I understand correctly that we're actually on the old business work plan uh, item of the agenda? Correct. Okay, um, great. I, I actually did have a, a question about this. Um, following up, you know, I, I think it was something that Frank might have raised at the, at the last meeting, um, just this idea of given, you know, kind of all the, all the pressures to, to rethink our, our schedule. And I appreciate the work that's been done on that. Um, to really be flexible to what we're hearing from commissioners and the public. Um, I think Frank had, had put out, Commissioner Maitsky had put out the idea of, can we actually fast track um, the, the proposal to move the mayoral election timing to get that ready and, and move it over to city council um, just to kind of reduce the volume of what we're trying to achieve with the rest of our time um, given that it, it seems from everything we're hearing from the commission and the public so far that there's probably a lot of support for that. And that is one of the very specific and perhaps the most time sensitive thing that the council had asked for. Um, so I just, I wanted to um, find out from, from uh, Lawrence what it would potentially look like to kind of get done that low hanging fruit, so to speak, how, how that process potentially could work. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, we have um, the, the, the bulk of the meetings for the next three meetings have been dedicated to study sessions. And so we'd have to talk about breaking those up um, or, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's options. I don't know what they are right now. Uh, it also begs the question of of the rest of the voting and elections um, recommendations and whether they're bundled. Um, you know, so it, it's it's I think a bigger question, and it's something that I would love input from the rest of the the commission on. You know, as far as their sense of the um, urgency of that compared to sort of presenting a um, complete package. Um, 
and I don't think we're going to be able to have that conversation right now because we have our study session queued up to start around six, but I will defer to the vice chair about how she wants to handle that conversation. Is there any way for us to have that conversation at the end after our speaking session, our study session is done? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would appreciate that um, we consider you know, having a discussion, consider taking ideas and go back to the chair and discussing with him. Um, he couldn't be here, obviously, tonight, so would like to, to get his thoughts about how he'd like to, to proceed as far as presenting recommendations, but certainly would love to hear, as I said, from, from the rest of the commission uh, about their thoughts on on how to I mean this this goes back to the conversation we had a couple of meetings ago about the final report and how to think about it so I do think that there is um, a little bit of a conversation as well uh, that sounded like folks weren't quite ready for at that point about what the format of recommendations look like um, it could be interesting to take this as an opportunity to to put together a, a template for that but you know I do think we would need to bookmark time just to talk about the recommendations format aside from the recommendation itself so you know that would would require I first like to get a sense of, of what the desire of the commission is and then we can put together some options to talk about in the future um, but um, we would have to do that uh, at the end of the study session I think after the study session Okay, we will make time to do that. Um, for now, I'm going to get started with the study session. So tonight we will hold a study session on the topic of policing, municipal law, accountability, and inclusion. Brian Kaur, Aaron Zaisor, Paul Parker, and Michael Jenico, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, Lawrence, would you please introduce our first guest speaker? Absolutely. Sorry about the delay. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Brian Kaur. Uh, he is the immediate past president and board member for the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And I know he's talked to a number of commissioners already and shared uh, his experience. And so, Mr. Kaur, welcome tonight. Uh, it sounds like you have about an hour of a presentation, then we'll do about 30 minutes of Q&A with commissioners. All right. <clears throat> Thank Take you so much, Lawrence. You bet. All right. Thank you so much. And um, first of all, it's really an honor to be able to speak to all of you. Um, I will just say that I just got home from work because my started at 8.30 this morning and it's now uh, 9.04. So I'm a little bit tired, but I think we'll be able to do this. And I'm just very glad, again, to have this opportunity. Um, it is such an important process that your city is undergoing. And I know that all of you have done more work than I can probably imagine as part of this process. So I hope to give you some information that will be helpful as you look at the issues of civilian oversight in your city. And I know there are a number of other presenters after me, so I will stay on as long as I'm able to. <laughs> I may not make it till the very end. And um, I do have a PowerPoint to share, but before I jump into that, I do just want to say a little bit more about me and who I am. Um, as you heard, I'm the immediate past president of NACOL, the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And I've been on the board since I believe 2012 and have been working in specifically in the field of civilian oversight since 2010. I'm the director of the Civilian Oversight Office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I always want to say just a little bit about who I am. I know I have a, a lot of information, not a lot of time. So I will just say that I was originally, uh, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, was born in the mid to late 60s. I won't be more specific than that, but really grew up in an era when the civil rights movement seemed to be achieving its promise, when some of the very serious issues of police misconduct and literally the killing of many, many black men in the city of Detroit by a special unit of the police that was formed after the um, uprising or commonly called riots in 1967, led to the election of our first African-American mayor and really affected the trajectory of how I think about um, my work and my role. And so I won't go into a big long bio, but just know that I've been doing presentations like this um, all around the country and even in Canada and Mexico, with the pandemic, it's all been on Zoom. So I had the opportunity, um, thanks to Commissioner Siegel, to present to that subcommittee and very glad to be part of this series of presentations tonight. So that is enough introduction. I am going to try to share my screen and um, see if I can then make that go into a full screen mode for all of you. 
nope, and that's not what I want to do. Oh, this is what happens when you're tired. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that presentation or most of it on their screen. I see a couple of nods. So again, Brian Core, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Nicole, and very, very glad to be here with all of you. So um, here are the topics I want to cover in the next 60 minutes, or maybe if I'm lucky, a little bit less. Um, really, just to give you a sense of the history of the field, why and how civilian oversight got started in the context of policing and law enforcement in this country, talking about the kind of basics of oversight, the pillars, how we got here, and then the nature and structure, which I think is of great interest to many people in your community, I'm sure all of you. Um, our new information that we've released last month on the state of the field and effective oversight practices, and then how to move to an effective practices framework. Again, in the spirit of thinking about what we have in our different cities, including yours, and then how to continue to modify that in a way that really supports um, the kind of public safety that our communities really want and deserve. So here we go, policing and civilian oversight. And you'll notice that the subhead says the history and the role of procedural justice and legitimacy. I think these are very key concepts. It's not just how we got here or what does oversight do, but really the fundamental basis behind our work. So the history of policing has come up a lot in recent times, and you'll hear many different versions, sometimes depending on who you talk to or their perspective. But um, what you see here is the, as it says, the standard narrative of US policing. I won't read through the whole slide. I know it's been posted uh, with the agenda, but it's really this idea of a small community, people may all know each other, or perhaps a county, a, a rural county where the sheriff is out doing his basic work because it was a he, and night watchman, hark, who goes there? Really this idea that we inherited this system uh, very organically from England, really from Germanic cultures, and that that is the foundation of policing and law enforcement. Really the small town into the large city. and. Another history, which is very important, and we've heard a lot about in the last two years, is the history of policing just being a form of modern day slavery and the slave catching history of policing. And there is real truth to that. Uh, this, again, I won't read the whole oath, but this is a slave patroller's oath from the state of North Carolina, 19, 1828, so just under 200 years ago. And as you say, people, as you see, people are taking an oath to search for guns and swords and weapons among the slaves. So slaves, not even human beings, just simply slaves. And this was an oath that people took. And again, I will point out, you see on the bottom there, this is from the Law Enforcement Museum. So even in law enforcement, there are people who are addressing this history. And I think it's important to note that this is not the entire history because you will also hear a lot about Sir Robert Peel. You'll notice the last slide dated 1829. This slide dated, I'm sorry, last slide dated 1828. This slide dated 1829. And this is a very common thing. Uh, policing experts, academics will talk about the history of policing and how modern policing in our nation goes back to the principles that Sir Robert Peel developed. Um, he was a minister in the a British government. He later went on to be prime minister. So as you can imagine, he didn't personally come up with these, but he was tasked with the creation of the Metropolitan London Police Department. And among the number of principles he developed, this one stands out because it really is this idea that police are simply members of a community who've been given this task of paying extra special attention to something that is incumbent upon all people to do. And so this idea that the police are the public and the public are the police is foundational to many theories about policing. And what I wanna say is that all of these are true. For us to have an understanding of where we've come from and where we are, it's not good enough to say, all policing is is modern day slave catching or policing is really a direct descendant of Sir Robert Peel with these fundamental democratic principles. Both are true, neither is true by itself. And for us to really be able to get into what policing and law enforcement are about, we have to embrace the totality of the history. And this is just a taste, but it's part of what we have to remember. 
So in this framework, this idea of the police are the public and the public are the police, since it is so often talked about within law enforcement circles and many others, I would say, and Nicole would say, that some form of civilian oversight is important to strengthen trust with the community. Again, as it says, I won't read ver verbatim the slides because it drives me crazy when people do that. But it is important that every community define what works in your community. And that is based on many different things. It really involves all stakeholders. And that's something you'll hear me repeat more than once, that all of the stakeholders in the community, everybody needs to be part of that discussion, of that planning and that development. And civilian oversight alone is not enough. It will not create peace and justice and security in and of itself. It will not allow the police to be completely legitimate in the eyes of every person in the community. But without oversight, it can be difficult, if not impossible, for the police to maintain public trust. So it's an important aspect of how this work is framed in the larger context of government communities. So another thing that comes up a lot is, you know, the people often say, well, this civilian oversight, these investigations, so often they find that the officers didn't do anything wrong. So there's this idea, lawful but awful is one way to put it, but really this concept of the police officers involved, they followed their training, they followed policy, they followed procedure, and yet the result is not what we want. This is not what our community needs or expects. And so when there's something that there's nothing wrong in terms of the officer performing something that was misconduct, there still may be issues that need to be addressed. And so it's really looking at these ideas of back-end accountability and front-end accountability. I'll say more about that later, but back-end accountability is what we typically think of when we think about accountability. How do we hold people accountable when they do something wrong? How do we allow that to deter others from doing something wrong with the presumption that the misconduct happens because people thought they could get away with it. So it's an important idea to think about not just how do you fix it when it went wrong, but how do you get ahead of problems? How do you design systems to address things that lead to problems? And then finally, procedural justice. I have a, a lot more on that, but you'll get what I'm saying later if you don't now. But this idea of procedural justice, of people being treated in a way that they perceive as just, is often more important than the fact that police may have the lawful and legal authority to do what they do. So one other thing about front-end accountability I wanna say is that um, I am not really the source of this concept in any way, shape or form, but there's a professor at the New York University School of Law named Barry Friedman. He leads the policing project and they've done a lot of really interesting work experimenting with how to have conversations with communities to look at underlying causes and to address this idea, again, as it says on the slide, of communities where people, sometimes the same people, will feel that when they call the police, they never come, they don't do anything, they don't help us out, and yet there's too much policing, there's too much surveillance, there are too many people being stopped. We've seen that in communities all over the country. So this idea of front-end accountability, the way the policing project looks at it, is really trying to figure out how to engage the community in setting the, the kinds of policing that a community wants, looking at how to have those conversations between police and the broader community. So just keep that in mind as we, we go through this work, that there's a necessary, a nece this is where I'm tired. There's a necessity to look at the issues of misconduct and what leads to misconduct, but there's also a necessity to look at how do you create systems and training and programs that lead to less opportunity and less potential of even, not just even misconduct, but the outcomes that we don't want to see. I always want to go back to the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing when I do this part of my presentation, because as you may know, it was formed by President Obama after wake, after the wake, in the wake of a number of events. It involved um, a group of people taken from policing, from community activism, uh, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, uh, Yale Law School professors, all on this task force that met in an accelerated timeline, held hearings around the country, uh, really worked to get the best thinking from experts from a range of fields, as well as testimony from community members and people in oversight and many other fields all over the country, came up with these six pillars. 
And uh, this report is still available. And if you haven't read it, I, I recommend the report is great. There's also an executive summary, which is a little more digestible and an implementation guide. A lot of really important concepts came out of this. Many um, departments and communities are still using this as a basis for how they're moving forward. But just know that this report um, said a number of really great things. And I always wanna highlight for people that it talks about in the second pillar of policy and oversight, the need for policies to reflect community values and that law enforcement agencies need to collaborate with community members to develop policies and strategies for all of the work they do. And that's a very important insight because again, it's not just about holding people accountable when something goes wrong, but creating the conditions for the kind of public safety our communities want and deserve. And I'll also mention that Nicole got a little shout out and that's great, but I'm not saying so much because, oh, look, it's Nicole, but because it's a recognition that even on the national level, there's an understanding, and there has been for years, that civilian oversight um, ranges dramatically in form and shape, but it's an important aspect of working to create the kind of policing, the kind of law enforcement, and really the true public safety that our communities want and deserve. And then procedural justice. I know I'm talking fast, I have a lot in here, so. But with procedural justice, this is a really important concept. And when you look at this idea of procedural justice, as I said, it's partly about how people are treated. And so these are the four keys to how people perceive that treatment, that they have voice. And this is true in any form of government, not just policing, any form of um, institutions that have systems and have an impact on people's lives. So you need to make sure that people are given the opportunity to feel that they have voice, they participate in decision making, they can have their position be heard, they're really just listened to, that those are, who are making decisions are neutral, neutrality, that they can trust them. The quality of treatment that people receive is respectful, that it affirms their human dignity, and that ultimately they have trust that the individuals making the decisions are concerned about people and they're, they want to do what's right, that they're doing their work for the right reasons. And these are these four basic concepts of procedural justice. And procedural justice is one of the things that really helps create the sense of legitimacy. And you know, the idea that police have the duty and right to do what they do, that law enforcement and other systems in government are doing things because it's a good thing and they should be doing it. You may not always agree with exactly how everything is done, but that fundamentally they are legitimate. And one of the things that we've really seen around the country are many people questioning the fundamental legitimacy of law enforcement as an institution, of the criminal justice, or some would say the criminal legal system and its legitimacy. And again, I won't read the slide, but these, these four concepts, uh, quality of decision-making, quality of treatment are very important. That idea of procedural justice being more important than the legal outcome. And I, I will just say quickly that the kind of classic example I often hear and I use myself is that an example is someone gets pulled over in a motor vehicle stop, a traffic stop. The police officer comes up to the car, you know, yells license and registration, please, you know, and goes back to the car, comes back and kind of reads the person the riot act, for lack of a better term, but really, you know, kind of yells at the person or speaks very sternly, tries to make them see that what they did was wrong and they should never do it again. But at the end, they give them a written warning. They don't give them a ticket. And the traditional thinking is, well, look, I did this person a favor. They didn't have to pay $200 for the ticket. And yet, compare that to an interaction where the officer walks up to the vehicle and says, Ex excuse me, my name is Officer Core. The reason I stopped you is that I observed you not come to a complete stop at that stop sign. If I could please see your license and registration, please, and have a civil conversation even if that person gets a ticket and has to pay a fine, they are more likely to feel that that was a legitimate interaction. They are much less likely to go tell their friends and neighbors and family members how terribly they were treated and how it was just embarrassing, and however they may have perceived it. So I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is a really key concept, this idea of legitimacy, because as you'll hear soon, it's not just for law enforcement, but doing this kind of work 
putting legitimacy into practice really does involve sustained, deliberate, thoughtful effort. It's not something that you can take a checklist and check the box and it's done. And this is true in policing, where these ideas that the police are trustworthy and honest, they're concerned about the well being of those they interact with, that people ought to accept their authority because it is legitimate, that they should voluntarily comply with the, what the police are asking them to do because it's overall a reasonable thing. And that as individuals, we should comply with the law and comply with the police. That is legitimacy in policing. And in civilian oversight, we also have to be legitimate in the eyes of the entire community, all of the stakeholders. So we have to ensure in our work, and I say this as a civilian oversight practitioner, that our agencies, our work, that we are honest and trustworthy and people see that we're concerned about the well-being of those we interact with, people who come to make complaints, people who are police officers who are being investigated, who are being accused of things, people who are coming to talk to us to understand more about we, what we do and why we do it, elected officials, appointed officials, colleagues in government. We have to have legitimacy with all of those people. And it's the same basic concepts that if we can demonstrate that our work is done in the spirit of legitimacy, that we are treating people in a procedurally just way, these other things generally flow from that. That people will see that what we're doing is reasonable, that they will want to comply, or at least think that they ought to comply. So that is legitimacy in civilian oversight. And one thing that um, I want to say quickly, there's a professor who many of you may have heard of if you study the field of oversight named Samuel Walker. He has talked about how procedural justice typically centers on how authority is exercised. And so that's a good way to think about it, that if you have authority, it's not just that you have it, you get to use it, or you people have to follow what you say, but you have to think about these principles of procedural justice. And as the last point says on this slide, it's also important within law enforcement agencies, because officers also need to be treated internally in a way that is procedurally just. And that is an issue that can really affect how police officers feel about their job and, and their own ability, simply as human beings, to go out and treat people well. Because if they feel that they are being mistreated to some degree internally, that can, whether we think it ought to or not, but that can affect how they treat those that they interact with, whether inside the department, in the broader community, or any place in between. And then the last part of this section is really about this contrast of these two types of authority. Statutory authority, this idea of there's a law and its foundation is usually, as it says on the slide, it's reactive. It's based on having authority and having power. It focuses on accountability and deterrence, the lawful use of authority. It's often measured by numbers and results. How many stops did we do? How many arrests did we make? How many cases did we clear? All important in many cases. And you contrast that with a legitimacy-based authority that's based on community expectations, on values. It's more proactive. It encourages willing compliance. It involves outreach to the community and all those same concepts of the quality of the process is as important as the outcome. And it can really lead to changing the conditions that have led to problems and it can be a very powerful way. Now, it doesn't mean that statutory authority is illegitimate, but what it does mean is that focusing on legit legitimacy-based authority can be a much better way to support the broader needs of the community and to imply that the work of policing, of law enforcement, of public safety is really in line with what the community is looking for and wants. Next, I wanna talk quickly about these three pillars of civilian oversight independence, transparency, and accountability. So independence, and I always say at the beginning of this piece, is that it varies widely because every place has different laws and ordinances. And so within that context, um, you, in oversight, people should have the ability to speak with the media. Again, you don't say things that are confidential or compromise investigations or speculative because we have specific responsibilities and oversight to ensure that the truth is found. And that always is true in investigations of any type or audits or reviews, but we should still be able to speak with the media as appropriate. 
to interact with other government agencies and officials, to produce and distribute reports, making recommendations, and making hiring decisions that are appropriate for the agency. Now, again, this varies greatly. There's no absolute list of this is exactly how you maintain your independence or these are the authorities you must have, but this is the general framework for independence that I like to share with people. Next, transparency. I, again, the idea of this is that it's a shared responsibility. It's not just up to the civilian oversight agency to decide what it wants to release. It has to conform with state law, with local ordinance, with evidentiary standards, but transparency has to be done also with the law enforcement agency. So it's a shared responsibility. I won't read through that whole list, but these are just different examples of how transparency um, can be used, how the effects of being transparent can really allow people to understand better what's happening. And, and it's all ways that you can take away some of the mystery. For too many people, things like civilian oversight or any kind of investigations are often just a black box. Something goes in, you wait a while, something comes out, and that's it. So to the extent possible in your context, you want to be as transparent as you can be. You want to release information, release reports, share data, and definitely do everything you can to help the community, that, and again, the entire community, every aspect of it, understand the work you're doing and why you do it and what it's resulting in. And then accountability has to be demonstrated by all stakeholders. And this accountability supports, as it says, goals of community-oriented policing. It can help hold law enforcement accountable. It can also improve the quality of departments' internal investigations. And it can validate community members. It can validate complainants. And it can invalidate, it can validate excuse me, officers when they're exonerated. Because, of course, there are things where People think something's gone wrong and it, actually nothing was done that was improper. There are times when people perceive something happened or there are just times when there are complaints and the officers really didn't do anything wrong. So that can be an important vindication for officers to have people who are outside of law enforcement, outside of that agency, validate what they did. And again, when something goes wrong, it's a more traditional form of accountability. Okay, that's a lot. So next, I'm going to move quickly into history. So the path to civilian oversight, really, um, first thing is what we're looking at. So with law enforcement, about 18,000 law enforcement agencies, everything from very small police departments to federal agencies, uh, postal inspectors are a form of law enforcement. There's a huge range. And as you look at law enforcement, you know, there are many large agencies that do have civilian oversight agencies associated with them, and it's growing in small and mid-sized cities. So many officers in the country do um, work with civilian oversight, and these departments will vary greatly. Again, tiny little departments, massive departments like LA. Um, so there's a real variety in what they do. And as it says again on the slide, every state, every community really has different laws and standards and ordinances, bylaws. So there's a huge variation. So to parallel that, there are a lot of variation in civilian oversight as well. Now you compare 18,000 to 220 or so, you know, there's obviously a lot of law enforcement agencies that don't have oversight. But again, most major cities do at this point and it's growing. But one thing to know is that traditionally, and I'll say more about this, many began in relation to specific incidents or even patterns of misconduct, as was seen in some of the um, you know, Department of Justice investigations that led to consent decrees, which started to include oversight in the earlier part of, earlier and mid part of the last decade. And increasingly, communities are establishing new oversight and, like San Jose, looking at their existing oversight as part of the national conversation on re-examining public safety and policing. So a very quick timeline here. When you think about civilian oversight, uh, there are some earlier precedents, but in the United States, we usually start by talking about the Committee on Constitutional Rights that was formed in Los Angeles by the LA Bar Association nearly 100 years ago. And it was an attempt outside the governmental structure to 
uh, take complaints, to do something about them, it had real limitations because, in fact, it was outside of the government structure. And even though they were lawyers, they still had limited ability to have a direct impact. A few years later, in 1931, a national commission, the Wickersham Commission, recommended that there would be a, some form of disinterested agency to combat lawlessness and law enforcement. That was in the context of the Roaring Twenties and Prohibition and all of the terrible issues that happened after that. But it was the first national recognition that these were real problems in policing around the country. Um, I would just quickly say, you look here on the timeline, 1948, you have a DC agency. In 53, the first New York City agency. 1958, an agency in Philadelphia. Each of those attempts to form oversight really didn't have staying power. Um, all of those places do have oversight today, but they are not those original institutions. And as an example, um, in Washington, D.C., I believe in about 13 years, they only addressed approximately 50 complaints. So it really wasn't having a big impact. And if you think about Washington in 1948, just after the war, the government was booming, the city was growing, uh, there were a lot of tensions, and there were clearly more than 50 people who had negative interactions with the police in the course of more than a decade. But coming into the modern era, we see uh, Kansas City in 1970. The reason that's here is that it still exists. So it is the oldest currently existing oversight agency, um, not too far from you, from my point of view in Massachusetts. In uh, Berkeley, the Police Review Committee was established by, um, I'm sorry, it's a city ordinance. That, and I should say that city ordinance was after a voter referendum that was passed. And Berkeley has just changed their oversight agency. They been through this process of revamping it. So by 1980, you have 13 civilian oversight agencies around the country. Um, most of them were in the kind of traditional civilian review board model where you had staff um, and some sort of board. By the year 2000, as I was taught to say growing up, you had over 100 civilian oversight agencies. And by the beginning of last year, by the beginning of 2020, there were more than 220 civilian oversight agencies. So that number has been growing dramatically. And that is really where we got to, to be today, that there is this transition from the evolution of oversight where there would be some kind of high profile incident scandal. And again, it's this framework that's, that's very legalistic. It responds to individual complaints, um, reviewing policies perhaps after complaints have come in and thinking maybe there's a problem with the policy was traditionally very legalistic, would have hearings. It really, in many ways, mimicked the, the trial system, that adversarial legal system. And as I mentioned, it really relied on deterrence, the idea that police misconduct happens because people want to do it and they think they can get away with it. So if they know that they will get punished, that will deter misconduct. And where civilian oversight has been moving is to be increasingly proactive to explore problems proactively, to look at the underlying issues and causes, changing the systems, and really changing the conditions that lead to misconduct. Again, a recurring theme in what I have to say. But it's also about building partnerships with law enforcement. Again, as an entity within government, it's, it's part of how you get your work done. It's not building relationships like, hey, we're, we're friends and we go out to dinner, but that working relationship. It has to, you have to have a relationship so that you can work together effectively because you have to work together in this effort. We in oversight have to be able to get information from police to work with police. And no matter what systems and rules and subpoena power you have, if there is not a working relationship, as we all know, human beings are very good at blocking progress, no matter what the rules and systems are. So you have to have those kind of partnerships. And finally, it can, in the ideal world, really build bridges between law enforcement and the wider community through education, through uh, positive change, and th on education in general, and through allowing the community to, to better have a connection to law enforcement in order to promote and see the kind of law enforcement that they want. Um, common goals of oversight, I'm not going to read through all these, but you can see from your screen, these are some pretty typical things. I know people may be listening. So things like uh, an accessible complaint process is a common goal of oversight. Ensuring that investigations are fair and thorough, findings are reasonable, discipline's appropriate, improving public confidence, enhancing transparency of the police organizations, improving 
the agency's ability to look at patterns of complaints and yes, to deter officer misconduct as, as well as reducing those conditions that lead to it. Also for a community, it reduces legal liability. We all know that part of the conversation has been the amount of legal liability that misconduct causes. That should not be the reason to not have misconduct, but it is important and to improve the public's understanding of policy and practices. So is civilian oversight the answer? Absolutely not. But again, without oversight, it can be difficult, if not impossible, to maintain the trust of the public for police. People have been calling for oversight for decades. The field is growing. And it's important to recognize that for many people, it is a necessity for improving things. So here's where I think uh, there may be more interest besides my theory, uh, theoretical conversation with you or one-way conversation at the moment, um, the nature and structure of civilian oversight. So oversight has many different forms. And the general way that we think about oversight is, again, really any system that investigates, audits, reviews, um, law enforcement, investigations, processes, complaints, use of force incidents, it conducts ongoing monitoring, monitoring of those law enforcement agencies, policies, procedures, training, management, supervision, it, and it includes any agency or procedure that involves active participation by people who are not sworn officers. And this is where I, I wanna make a quick note that no term in this field is perfect. Civilian, citizen, those are the two common terms. I, I can. I think many people understand that citizen can sound very exclusive because if you are not a citizen, what does that mean? Civilian comes from this concept often of the military or um, some sort of institution like that, and they're civilians and sworn. But this, these are the terms that we use. So for lack of better terms that are commonly understood, we still stick with civilian oversight. We have not yet changed the name of NACOL, but this is the the basic concept of civilian oversight. And we really have a what we consider a big tent. It includes people who are monitoring consent decrees. It includes people who would be doing what's traditionally called internal affairs, but are outside the police department, are doing that work as a civilian led and, and perhaps a hybrid civilian uh, sworn staffed agency of investigators and other analysts. So, and there are common models, which again, people commonly know about this, but I'll say a little bit about each model very briefly. Um, review focus model, investigation focus model, monitor, auditor, inspector general are models that we talk about. And then hybrids are some combination, right? So when we think about the review focus model, this is kind of a classic civilian review board. It can ensure that the community has an ability to provide input into the complaint investigation process. And that review of investigations by members of the community can increase public trust in that process. And it can, and it varies quite a bit, it can be authorized to review complete internal investigations and may be able to disagree with the findings. And in some places, it also means uh, because of ordinances and policies that the police department executive, the chief, the commissioner, the director of public safety, may have to respond to those and provide a rationale of why they did it or why they're not accepting the findings of some form of oversight agency, whether it's a review focus model or something different. There's also the investigation focus model. This is often what people will think about when they're looking at what they want for oversight. Um, the idea that you, the police, how could they investigate themselves? We need an outside agency. So it can, in fact, reduce bias and in investigation in, into complaints. Um, those full-time investigators can have and should have highly specialized training. Um, they don't need to be police officers. They can be former or current in some situations police officers. But there are many different fields, auditing, private investigators, or even people who don't have a background but go through extensive training to be investigators. And that means that these are not investigators that are solely within or at all within the police department, but they are part of the oversight agency and they can really increase community trust. And they're generally, this is generally a system that's done in larger communities. Um, in my city of Cambridge, we have about 120,000 people. We have just under 300 officers. 
And I will say we are in a good position because we generally get less than 15 complaints a year at the oversight agency. The police department can also take complaints. They may get five or 10 a year. And um, we, those, we take them all very seriously. But it also would say to you that having a full-time investigator might be more challenging in a city our size as compared to a city with over a million people. And then there's the auditor monitor focus model. Uh, this is a model that has evolved quite a bit, and it's probably the model that we're seeing most often being implemented in new um, oversight agencies, and it's basically the model that you currently have in San Jose. It can have more robust reporting practices and other models, and it can really be more effective in promoting the long-term systemic change that many people are looking for. Um, it doesn't usually involve doing any kind of investigations, and yet that auditor or monitor, as you can hear from the name, um, can often be actively engaged in many or all aspects of the complaint process and even the investigative process in many places. And then what many, many places are looking at as well are hybrids. Now hybrids can come in a couple of different basic forms. They can be a model where you have an existing oversight agency and another agency is added. So New York City had the Civilian Complaint Review Board, um, the largest oversight agency in the country with over 100 investigators investigating complaints for numerous categories as they come in. But then a few years ago, New York City, New York City um, started an office of an inspector general for public safety. So you have one office that's looking at individual complaints. There's another office that is doing systemic reviews, looking at broader patterns and issuing very hard hitting and important reports as part of the city's Department of Investigations, looking at issues like stop and frisk that go beyond any individual complaint. Um, and these, these kind of hybrids can also exist in a single agency where you have these different pieces based on the needs of the community, um, the history of a community, and the expectations. And as I said, they are increasingly common. So um, I won't read this. This is just a, a kind of a summary overview, just for comparison. Sometimes I have more to say about this, but in the interest of time, I will keep going. And here's another thing I want to talk about for a bit, and I think it's very important, credibility for oversight. So for civilian oversight to be credible, we have to be familiar. And when I say we, let me back up for a moment. We means every aspect. It's the staff of a civilian oversight agency. If there's a civilian review board, a commission, some kind of review or um, entity of people taken from the community, they have to also follow this. They have to get that training on how the police department does its work, what they're supposed to do. They don't need to be experts in criminal law, but they have to have a basic understanding. They need to be impartial and objective. Now that doesn't mean they forget why we're here. And it doesn't mean they forget that we need to pay attention to all aspects of our community. And we have to have pay careful attention to those who've been marginalized and think about those voices, those experiences. And we have to be objective. We have to be focused on the process as that process happens and not make assumptions. We have to be, as it says on the slide, willing to consider all sides of a situation and, and reconsider. We have to comply with confidentiality laws and evidentiary standards. And we have to be willing to meet with and communicate with those police organizations and their staff. Again, not because we're best friends, but because we have to be able to get information. We have to be able to do analysis. We have to be able to know what happened and have access to officers. So it's important that we are credible in those ways, those of us who are involved in oversight. And training is vitally important. And this is a big part of what NACOL, the National Association, does. But it's not just NACOL. There are other entities that do training. So again, those policies and procedures of the local agency, um, the essentials of civilian oversight, a lot of what I'm talking about, but in much greater detail. And it's really important that individuals involved in civilian oversight understand their authority and their responsibilities, and that that is shared with the broader community. Because very often, uh, people will tell me that, well, our experience is that oversight failed. And what I will say is that in almost every case, Oversight failed to meet the expectations of the community, and there can be many reasons for that. So it's important that 
there's clarity around the authority and responsibilities of an oversight agency. And again, I won't, I'm tempted to read this out loud, but I won't, I will just say as the heading says, training and professional development are essential for credibility. New board members have to get extensive training when they come in. Um, if you have some sort of civilian oversight board and commission, certainly staff need extensive training. And it's a critical step in making a strong agency and a strong board or commission, if that's part of your model. Those responsibilities of, of creating that training need to be shared between the, the civilian oversight practitioners on staff and the board members themselves, if you have a board. And there has to be that commitment to people being well-informed, to having the knowledge they need to do their work well. And I always want to say that um, one of the things I take most seriously about this work is that I am a public servant. I serve the public. So for some people, government officials, it's bureaucracy, it's opaque, it's systems, it's power. For me, it really is service. And as a director of an oversight agency, I, I see myself as a, a servant leader in that way. And that all of us in this work really have to take seriously that we've been entrusted to treat everybody in a professional, fair, and impartial manner. Everybody we work with. And that happens through this firm commitment to the public good, our mission, and holding ourselves to very high ethical and professional standards, and that we have to be continually seeking professional development. Uh, we have to acquire the knowledge, and um, you know, this is something that often bears repeating. It is a continuing process. Like, like any professional field, there, there's always new information. You have to refresh what you know, and you have to always be willing to learn and grow. So uh, we have a code of ethics. Um, it's on the NACOL website, but again, I won't read through these uh, nine bullet, these eight bullet points, but just know that we take very seriously our responsibility and that all of these things, whether it's our personal integrity, it's the transparency that we um, show in our work, the relationships we build, and that uh, we always have in our mind that our primary obligation is to the community. And again, to the entire community, to all of the stakeholders. It's very important. And we have to question ourselves. We have to be constantly looking at how are we doing things? Are we doing things as well as we can? Are we learning from our experience and learning from others? And that's part of why um, it, it's so important when NACOL is actually able to bring people together in person. Uh, we'll, we're planning to do our conference in December this year and our in-person conference because that kind of sharing is as important as the education, which we're also doing right now through our virtual conference online through from now through October. So both aspects are important. Um, so the last big thing I want to get into is this really exciting report <laughs> for us. So as part of the President's Task Force in 21st Century Policing, NACOL sent a, a number of people officially from NACOL and people from the NACOL community, um, including people like Barbara Attar, the past police auditor in San Jose, testified before and sent testimony to the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And one of the recommendations that they heard was that there should be more research to look at what is effective in oversight. Um, as I've gone on and on about the diversity and the differences, it can be very challenging to measure what is effective in oversight and for, to really demonstrate to people why it matters and why we should do it. So part of that report led to a grant opportunity. NACOL got a, uh, what was a two-year grant in 2016. It took us longer because of the uh, difficulty of the work but also that there were some delays during the past administration. I'll just leave it at that. But this report just came out in July and it um, is really exciting. It involved nine case studies uh, that looked at specific cities. I'll say a bit about that in a moment, those cities. It included this report on the state of the field and effective practices. There's a decision-making guidebook that NACOL initially developed through work we were doing in Mexico to help establish um, the first efforts to create civilian oversight in that country and which are ongoing. And there's this interactive online toolkit that allows anyone to go online and search for different agencies, see what kinds of authorities they have, what kinds of structure. And it's all available on the NACOL website as well as the Department of Justice website. But these nine case studies 
I'll just say, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can see the communities that were studied range from Cambridge with 100, that was 113,000 people, um, to about 120 now, to Los Angeles, about 4 million people. Vastly different types of departments, different types of oversight agencies that are overseeing those departments. And through those case studies and lots of research and surveys, NACOL came up with uh, these key principles for effectiveness and sustainability. So here's a, a top level in a, that the number of a civilian oversight agencies continues to grow. I've mentioned that a couple of times. Data-driven policy analysis is increasingly common. And that's part of why we're seeing this increasing focus on things like monitors and inspectors general and auditors, because people are realizing that often that data-driven policy analysis is what allows you to change the issues and concerns and problems and training and mistraining that lead to misconduct or simply bad outcomes. Access to records and information varies greatly. It is one of the things that most people in the field talk about. It is challenging in most communities to access the data that we need, but increasingly people are making progress on that. Um, accountability and evaluation requirements are growing for oversight. Uh, for a long time, we did what we did. We, we said it was good. We believed it made an impact. But more and more, we are also asked to demonstrate that there, is, there are, there's really valuation in what we're doing and that we really are accountable to the community as well. And as I've said three or four times, this focus on front end rather than simply only back end accountability is increasing and procedural justice and legitimacy. So you can see that the, the core of this presentation is totally in line with this report, partly because this is what we've been working on for the last few years. And um, there are 13 principles. I'm not gonna go through all 13 of these. I am trying to watch the time here. But um, the key to this is that this is not a list of the 13 absolutes you must have. You'll notice that we say, effective practices and not best practices. And the reason for that is the incredible diversity of civilian oversight, the incredible diversity of policing and law enforcement and correctional oversight or correctional agencies and the incredible diversity of communities. So all of these are important to look at, but never let it be said that if an agency doesn't have all 13 of these things going really well, that it's ineffective. That is not what this framework means. But when you look at these, you'll see the things that seem, I think, like obvious things. You want adequate funding to, to do your work. You want to make sure that people who make complaints are treated with confidentiality and that they have protection from retaliation. Um, but there are also things that may not be as obvious. Sustained stakeholder support. Um, clearly defined and adequate jurisdictional authority. Some of the biggest problems have been when it's unclear what authority an oversight agency has, and it, it leads to fights that you don't need to have if you can be very clear about what that authority is. So again, all important things, but you have to evaluate them within this framework. And so as I, I work to wrap this up, again, thinking specifically about the process that your city is engaged in um, and any charter review process, but specifically looking around these issues in this time. You know, there are, as I said, limitations on this applicability of a best practices approach, which is why NACOL is focused on these effective practices that can serve as a foundation for successful and effective oversight. And again, as I've said before, this form of oversight has to meet the needs of your community, but it has to be something that is truly possible and feasible um, in your legal, political, social environment, and that it's congruent with the expectations of the broader community. And if people say, what's the best form of oversight, which they ask me all the time, the best form of oversight, it depends on your local circumstances. And there is no best form. You have to figure out what works in your own context. And again, uh, a lot of text here, but those complexities of political and social context make it very challenging. So it, it's really important that you do this work in a thorough and careful way. And you can't just borrow from one community and bring it to another. You can learn from other communities. They have important experiences, 
But it, it's also important to know that even within a single state, you can't simply do a cookie cutter. Well, this is, seems to be working great there. We'll just plop it down here. You have to figure out how that was formed. And um, I know in this, this evening's night, you're going to hear some of that from San Diego County. But you, you have to then take that and figure out how it applies to you, where it applies, where it doesn't apply. And again, I'm not going to read through all of these things, but it, it is hard in this field to do these systemic comparative measures because of the nature and the goals of oversight. There are not standard definitions um, within different, uh, among different cities, different departments. It can be really challenging. Um, it's not just comparing apples to oranges, but apples to oranges, to cherries, to peaches, to grapes, to soybeans, and all sorts of other vegetables and fruits. And no two civilian oversight agencies are the same, as I've said many times. Um, so just keep in mind, there are many possible paths to success. The development of oversight has to allow for flexibility and context while still taking into consideration uh, the various things that make oversight successful and effective, and I would say sustainable. Um, you have to focus on these core values and principles of good, true public safety. And it's important to value the perspectives and, and wisdom of experienced practitioners in the field, um, especially in your own community, but also around the country, which again, I'm so appreciative that you've asked me and others to present to you this evening. And stakeholder input has to be prioritized. Dialogue with stakeholders has to be prioritized. And again, I see that is what is happening in San Jose. I know it can always be more, it can always be better. I have yet to find a community, including my own, that does not struggle with how to really listen to deeply and hear all voices and honor them and create forms and frameworks within the limitations of government that really hear from people and we can never give up. It's that classic thing. Um, we may never complete the task of figuring out how to really listen and engage uh, with all stakeholders effectively, but neither can we lay down the task and just say, well, we can't really do it. We're going to hear from the same people. Let's move on. It has to continue. And as you look at those 13 principles, these, I will re read these, you have to really look at one, is this particular practice an appropriate fit for your local context? How will that practice strengthen oversight in relation to the other 13 principles? And very importantly, what are the potential unintended consequences of implementing a practice? Um, and this isn't about the 13 practices, but a quick little story. A couple, three years ago, I went to New York City to testify before their Charter Review Commission. And um, I did a similar presentation with some other people, but one of the issues was that the city uh, was getting a lot of people saying, we want to have an elected civilian oversight board. That's the only way it will be fair. That's the only way it will be accountable to the voters. And the challenge that I saw, a, a very strongly um, probable unintended consequence, as from the promoters unintended, is that in New York City, if you create elections for a civilian oversight board, then it suddenly becomes politics in the sense of electoral politics, in the sense of spending and massive campaigns. And we know that in New York City, there are four very powerful public safety police unions, and they would really work hard to ensure that they got who they wanted elected to that oversight board. So um, people who were coming out of an activist space, which I didn't go into my personal history, but I used to work at the ACLU. Uh, I started as an activist out of college back in the 80s, and I still have that at my core. But activists, we sometimes believe that we're, we're right and we're smarter and we can, we can make it happen. And you have to be wary of those unintended potential consequences. So finally, as you are thinking about how to look at oversight, you want to really think strategically. I won't read through all of these, but basically building on opportunities, building goodwill with stakeholders every step of the process, thinking about what we need to do right away and, and what we can put on the back burner. And once you have an oversight agency or even a process, you have to constantly be adapting to conditions. And I know as I, I came into the, the end of the previous conversation, even the process that this commission is undergoing, you're adapting to conditions as you go along in order to achieve your mission. So very important. 
Um, as you look at new and revamped oversight, which is part of our conversation, think about what you hope to see in five years, what you hope will come out of this. And I would, I would encourage people to go beyond, it will be community-based, it will hear, everyone's voice will be heard, it will create legitimacy, to really thinking more specifically about what do you hope this oversight agency will look like and what you will see in five years, how you will set expectations and measure success. Again, that same point about clarity around expectations and how do you actively listen to and honor all voices, all voices, perspectives and lived experiences. I, I can't emphasize that enough. So I almost always end these presentations with these two slides or these two images on this slide. So on the left is an image um, from a wonderful artist based in Minneapolis, uh, Ricardo Levens Morales. Um, it's, it's an artist, artistic representation of this concept, the slogan that came out of South Africa that um, really was generated in the disability rights and youth activist community. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. Nothing about us, without us is for us. And in this context, I know I've said about 15 or 20 times, that means the entire community, all of the stakeholders, everybody who will be touched by civilian oversight, which is everybody, I would argue, nothing about us, without us is for us. And then on the other side of the screen, uh, this is a quote that's often, if you look it up, you'll see it attributed to someone named Willa Watson, who is an Aboriginal Australian activist. But she would always say that this was not her. She didn't develop this herself. This was She sort of got the credit for something that was how her community in Queensland, Australia, talked in the 1970s. But this is the quote. If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So with that, um, people know how to find me. I'm pretty transparent. And this is all over the internet, but I just want people to know that um, I am here as a resource. Nacole is here as a resource. And um, we are very, very glad to have been able to be part of this work and this journey and to accompany you. And um, with that, I, um, I'll sleep for a, a moment more and I will then stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to the well, I, I guess I think Lawrence handed off to me. So as we yeah. as we do, um, now I've lost my mouse. There we go. All right. I Thank think you, I Mr. kept Core. it to almost an hour. <laughs> well, well timed and a fantastic presentation. Very much appreciate your your insights and your time with us. And uh, while we have a little more of your time, I'm going to open it up immediately to questions from commissioners. Commissioner Hui Tran. Oh. Uh, good evening, Mr. Core. That was a phenomenal presentation, I must say. Um, very informative. And actually, it was kind of odd because like for about a good five to 10 minutes of it, I, every time I had a question, your next slide answered the exact question. So I was like, this is kind of weird. Um, I try to do that. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> um, so uh, you, know, you, you had some great examples of places of different models across the city. I'm actually curious about a, a city uh, that you may have some information about or reference to about where the city or the jurisdiction tried to implement a civilian oversight, but the process itself went wrong, um, or maybe it was just like um, uh, or ultra contentious. I mean, I think as we explore some of the questions that we look at, we also want to be wary of potential pitfalls as we encounter while we're looking at um, these ideas. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner. That's a great question. And I think I would say it's, it's back on track. 
but it's been a long journey. And um, I know that um, Mike Giannaco, who's going to be presenting later, has also been part of this journey. I want to say a little bit about the city of Newark. I'll try to be brief. So Newark, New Jersey, long history. Um, it goes back to just like my home city, um, about 1967 and even before that. But the uprisings, the riots that happened there, um, many years of complicated history. But throughout decades, people called for oversight. Eventually, the ACLU of New Jersey and community activists worked to get the United States Department of Justice to come in, do one of those uh, civil rights invest investigations, pattern and practice, basically looking to see if there's a systemic abuse of people's constitutional rights. They found that there was. They put in, they agreed to a consent decree between the city and the federal government. One of the things that was in that consent decree was to create civilian oversight. So borrowing from the name of New York across the river, they created the Newark Civilian Complaint Review Board. Now, part of their idea, um, and they had a lot of support from the ACLU of New Jersey in this as well, was to create, as they said, the strongest form of oversight ever, basically. They wanted to create a model. And immediately it was sued. Um, the city was sued by the Federation of Police. It went to the courts. Um, the, the legal case is still a bit ongoing because it's been appealed, but um, initially there was an injunction. Uh, it took away most of the powers of the oversight agency, um, but they, they were still able to do training. But it really um, took the wind out of the community's sails. So uh, there, again, there was training, it was helpful, but it took about two more years for the legal cases to wind their way through the courts. Um, most of the powers of the oversight agency were given back. And just earlier this year, they hired their first two investigators. So they are, they are starting. But that whole process was intensely painful for the community. They had invested so much in being this model and being the strongest and the best, and we're going to do it better than anybody else. And instead, it got caught up in the legal system and, again, there's still some outstanding things being appealed, but finally, it's it's up and running. And um, I, I I think I often give that example because I've seen it up close, and I really give credit to the people who are who are on the oversight board and to the staff because they have hung in there. It has been a difficult journey, and they were peppered by the community about why aren't you doing anything? This is ridiculous. Can't we just do it anyway? And they're they're getting there, but. Okay, that was longer than I intended to answer, but um, hopefully, hopefully that helps to answer your question, Commissioner. That's great, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. So I have Commissioners Matsumura and then Gilman. Thank you, and I just wanna really echo the thanks to you for this very informative presentation now at 10.08 p.m. on your coast after a long day of work. Really, really grateful. Um, You're welcome. So, I'm gonna probably try to squeeze two questions into one um, of just kind of how to structure the, the leadership of a civilian oversight body or agency itself. Um, one, if there were lessons around an, an individual and auditor model, similar, more similar to what we have now versus distributing that across a board or having that auditor be reporting to some kind of border commission. Um, as well as, you know, you referred to the idea of, uh, and some of the potential unintended consequences of having um, a person or people in that position being elected. What have been the lessons about, about alternatives <clears throat> to elections as a method of selection and accountability for the oversight um, body or agency itself? Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, trying to watch the time on my end, and, and I know that there are others who are presenting after who can also address some of those from their perspective, which may be different from mine, but the, you know, the, I'd say typically you have a staff, you know, a, a medium to larger size agent, you have a staff with a director, like any government agency. I mean, I, I really encourage people to think of this as something that is inside the government, that is a 
a, an agency of public servants. And then if you have a board or commission, it's similar to other boards or commissions where depending on exactly how it's structured, they may have um, a role directly or indirectly in hiring and selecting that director. That director may report to them as well as to a city manager or mayor or um, in some places like Portland where they, they have a commission form of government. I mean, there are a lot because governments are also different. There are many different ways to do it. But I would say that um, the core of any effective, well, well I, I should never say that any, the core of the vast majority of effective oversight agencies is having permanent staff who can really be there and sort of do the day-to-day -day work, manage the processes, whether that's investigations or audits or reviews, and support the, the board members or the commission members, making sure that they're getting training, that they're getting materials, that they understand their role and they get the support they need. Um, in terms of selection, there are so many different ways to do it. I mean, in California, I know a number of communities, at least in the farther north in the Bay Area, have models where, say, each member of a city council gets to appoint a member of a board or commission. We don't have that where I am in, in New England. I, I mean, I, there are good things and bad things about that, I would say, um, because when you choose people for an oversight board or commission, there's a certain piece that's representational, but you also want to have people that are really able to do the work that can come in with the kind of the right attitude, all those things about uh, understanding why we're here, but also being fair and impartial, um, helping to shepherd the process. And then, um, yeah, I, I don't know that there's any one way I've seen. I mean, there's so many different ways. In my community, boards and commissions are appointed by our city manager who reports directly to the city council. Some people think that that's really great because you get out of the politics of having mayors who change, who might have different people that they want to put on things. On the other hand, there are people that say that that's a step too far removed from the people. You know, it's, it's all debatable, but it, it kind of, I, I guess I would say, looking at whatever has worked in your community about how you appoint boards and commissions that are legitimate to the broader community and work would be where I would start. Hopefully that answers both questions. Great, thank you. So I have um, Commissioners Gilman, Amador, Fuentes, and Sanchez. Commissioner Gilman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Core. I appreciated the presentation, and you actually answered my first question, which had a lot to do with the selection process for the individuals on these commissions. But as a follow-up to that, what are the typical skills and experiences that uh, should be looked at when selecting these types of individuals to sit on these commissions? And secondly, are they typically paid positions or volunteer positions? Uh, again, great questions, and um, I will say that you know there's a lot of information on the NACOL website and, and NACOL full-time staff who can who are a little bit more nuanced on that are a little bit more aware of all the details from different cities. However, having said that, in general, most oversight um, boards and commissions uh, they're they're not paid. They they may get. Um, you know, reimbursement or some, but some will get say $50 an hour or something like that for the time they spend. Because in general, depending, and again, it depends on your model. But if you're looking at um, completed investigations, whether they're done by the police department or they're done by the oversight agency, that can take a lot of time, depending on the number of investigations and complaints, the amount of backing material and information. And so um, I would say, and for all of those things, the really important thing is to get the training. So you can really truly have people from all sorts of different backgrounds, depending on the role and the type of training they get. Um, mostly, I would say, you know, you, it, you often will see people who have time to volunteer, right? So they're often professional people. Um, and this is part of why I think the ACLU has been pushing a model of community organizations, um, nominating people, um, but again, you know, I, I would say that that's not the best practice. It's an interesting practice. I mean, again, I think there are unintended consequences. Um, you also really want to have, I'd say in any oversight board, you do want to reflect as much as possible, and this is hard, the diversity of the community. Now, if you have five people, seven people, nine people, 15 people, you can never represent all aspects of diversity, but you really want to have a board that has some diversity in terms of ethnicity, um, types of interests, parts of the community they live in, 
age, and and yet, and the in the final analysis, you want those people to be able again to be fair and impartial, to be able to come in and take the time to do the work. And I would say that's why some places do pay stipends because uh, they found in those communities that in order to find people who are not all professionals with graduate degrees or all retired, um, you may have to do something to compensate people for their time or just to make it possible for them to give up potential work time. I think hopefully I answered most of that. Great, thank you. Commissioner Amador. Sorry, um, I was also going to ask a little bit more on that appointment. Um, and he answered my, the question, so thank you. Okay, you bet. So, you're, you're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Fuentes. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, welcome. To, thank you. Um, to our, our community, virtually. Um, my, my question has to do, and, and I really didn't see it too much, um, how how do you include what is the best way to include the voice of um this could be family members whose whose um family member was a victim um of police misconduct and you know at all levels and also people who themselves were victims and i didn't see that much of that and maybe i i, I might have missed it but how do you how do we really include that because to me it seems i mean i like the idea of working together and you know like with the quotes that you had at the end but those that quote the one about nothing about us without us um and then it's for us i've heard that more in I, my field is mental health that's where i work mm -hmm. and it was the the statement that was used by our clients our consumers who when we talked about mental health services, they wanted to be included in planning and, and developing the service because they were saying nothing without mm -hmm. us, nothing about us without us. And so that's the, the that I am thinking of is how do we do that in a better way? Mm -hmm. no, I, in other words, including real... family members or persons who were um, involved as victims, quote, victims of police misconduct. Yeah. So this that's that's a, a great question. And I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a very honest answer. And this is my personal perspective. I think it represents a lot of NACOL, but this is me. And you will find other people in our our network, our community organization that look at it a little differently. I, I work really hard and I believe that we do need to always hear the voices of people who have been victims of police misconduct that um, that needs to inform our work, and they may actually be on oversight boards, and that depending on again how they're how those boards are chosen. And I want to encourage people to think of oversight again outside of that framework of of simply looking at police misconduct and addressing it and deterring it. And so, to that extent, um, I think it's a little different because. That, that's why I keep saying all stakeholders. Um, and it's not to minimize the, the vitally important fact that this is why we have civilian oversight in general. Oversight exists because of police misconduct, because people have been abused, because people have died at the hands of police, because of the multi-hundred year legacy of white supremacy, of violence that's endemic in our nation, of the genocide of people who inherited these lands before many of our ancestors came here, whether we wanted to, they wanted to come here or not. And at the same time, I personally see oversight as doing that and more. That it really is about building on those roots and those foundations to create the kind of public safety that we want. So that that's why I think that when I use that phrase, and I, I, I appreciate your recentering it on the disability community, because my understanding is that phrase really came out of both disability and youth rights activists in South Africa. But for, for us to be able to center multiple voices and multiple experiences, and that includes law enforcement. Now, this is sometimes controversial, because if you think of law enforcement as people who have power over others and abuse them and can often do it with impunity, that, that will certainly inform your perspective, and that is very real. And I think, to me, we've seen the limits of using that kind of punitive um, 
and even not only punitive, but just deterrent focused approach. So I mean, that's not a long theoretical thing. And, and to go back, it's, it's, I don't intend, and it's not my belief that um, to minimize the real lived experience of those who have suffered and continue to suffer. I mean, I have stories from my own family. I won't get into them now, but I will just say that um, my mother's first cousin was killed um, by the police a few years ago in Dearborn, Michigan. And she was having a mental health crisis and she needed help. And instead she was killed by the police. And my mother still lives with that every day. She has her own encounters that were much more minor. So I, I say this not to say, oh, see, I'm see, I'm okay. You can listen to me. But but to say that even with those experiences, my hope is that we can build on this and do something that's broader. So I yeah, I'm going on for a long time, but hopefully Thank that you. helps at least understand where I'm coming from. Thank you. It's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, um, Lawrence, I think you're muted. If you were calling, oh gosh, someone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We're, Thank you, it's Mr. Zoom, Sanchez. <laughs> Zoomatics. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Kaur, for that excellent uh, presentation. And I'm uh, uh, interested in this field because uh, uh, I've worked with many police officers. Uh, I come from the field of education, and for tw for about 25 years, I worked with very close with police officers in all kinds of situations, incidents that took place in, in the in the schools. In fact, one individual I worked with was uh, uh, Officer Shawnee Williams, who's now police chief up in the uh, East Bay. And, and he comes out, uh, comes out a lot on TV periodically with uh, things that happen up in that area. But, but you know, uh, so I, I, I have some, uh, some ideas, some observations. One, I really feel that every police officer should have a degree in psychology before they're getting into this field. You know, that's just uh, my uh, perception. Uh, but I was thinking, uh, in terms of, of the the oversight so on that 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 uh, that's being looked at, um, a lot of this deals with after the fact. So once everything has happened, now now we're going to take a look at what could have been done to prevent this. So so I'm thinking, what what could be done to work more closely with uh, police officers, police unions, so on, training programs, uh, to make sure that it doesn't get to this point, you know. That, that everything is done more, uh, you know, done better, more correctly, so that these situations be, uh, are avoided. And, and I, you know, again, I don't know what the answer is, but I think, I think a lot of it deals with the training of our police officers. And I think the training for a lot of police officers, uh, police officers are, are minimal uh, and, and the standards are, are somewhat minimal. And I think those are something that, that we need to look at in, in order to, to get uh, a much, much better uh, trained uh, police force uh, for our cities and, and avoid, and possibly avoid situations like this. Maybe not every situation, but, you know, try to uh, improve the, the police force, the training so that we don't get to this point. You know, anyway, so mm -hmm. that, those are just some thoughts that I wanted to uh, share with you. And I just want to thank you once more uh, for your excellent presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And I, you know, I, I wish we had more time, which seems silly because <laughs> it's late at night for me. But um, your points are extremely well taken. Um, interestingly enough, on Thursday and Friday, I attended a policing conference in Rhode Island where I basically gave the same presentation to about 60 law enforcement officers. Um, it was, you know, through a, uh, the Guardians um, in Rhode Island, which is primarily an African American based policing organization, and you know, got some pushback, but. I think, you know, whether it's education like this about oversight, but more importantly, police training desperately needs to change in many places. And uh, again, you've got Mike Giannacco coming up. He is a real expert in a lot of this. But the types of training that police undergo, the fact that they spend more hours looking, uh, talking about use of force and how to do that effectively, firearm training, then de-escalation. Um, one of the things that I didn't put in this presentation, I did in that, is looking at the role of trauma the trauma of community members, and thinking back to what Commissioner Fuentes said, um, understanding that trauma can help police officers, but it also helps them to understand the trauma they undergo. In the current environment, a lot of people don't really want to hear about the trauma that police officers undergo. It's like they signed up for it. But we know, I mean, the simple way people say it is hurt people hurt people. 
Uh, police are trained to think about everything as a threat. They're trained to be hyper vigilant. And this is, these are broad brush statements, but they're generally true. Um, this whole idea that the president's task force talked about, about moving from warriors to guardians mm -hmm. is, is really important. It's an important shift. And one of the things I said when I presented on Friday in Rhode Island, what, cause actually I went there in person, it was very strange, but um, was to talk about the need to go beyond guardians to actually co-creating public safety with the community, not seeing themselves as the experts who've been given this task and okay, you guys go figure it out and, and make us all safe, but that it needs to be this constant process of co-creation. And if, if police officers can be trained that way to not think of themselves as warriors or, or and at least guardians and I'll tell you, one thing that I just want to end is the fact that both within training and in the broader police culture, there's this endless stream of horrible videos, videos of police officers being killed, videos at motor vehicle stops, videos and all these other, all sorts of situations. And these get shared. Um, if you look at, um, you know, George Floyd, the death of George Floyd and some of the things that came out around that Minneapolis, the department had banned this kind of warrior training. So police officers just went out and got it on their own. I mean, there, there's so much around police and culture that's toxic. And then the last thing I would say is a lot of that toxicity, though, I would say it's not the fault of individual police officers. It's, it's in large part driven by, it's not because of, but it's driven by the fact that policing can be a highly traumatic profession. It's not the most dangerous in terms of loss of life. And in fact, many more officers die by suicide each year than die on the line of duty. So it's, there's a huge amount of trauma. And if, if that doesn't get addressed, it can be really hard to change these issues of misconduct. And then finally, I'm calling, sorry, so you start me talking about this. <laughs> I think that a place where there is potential common ground, and this is something I'm deeply passionate about, is looking at trauma, historical trauma, community trauma, personal trauma, and if you can help officers to understand the trauma that first maybe victims of crime or sexual assault victims have, and then understand the trauma that community members may have, and, and not just that interpersonal trauma, but that broader historical and community trauma, and then help officers understand the trauma that they experience and stop all the maladaptive behaviors, working 80 hours a week with overtime, you know, avoiding their families, all these different things, and there's many more, that, that just increase their disconnection from their, their humanity. Um, it's not a, the be-all and end-all, but so many situations I think that we see are driven not from racism or power-hungry police, but people who are hurt and hurting and not able to take care of themselves and not able to take care of the people they're sworn to protect. So anyway, I'm sorry, you, you gave me a platform, but I, I think that that's a really important set of points. So thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. So we're gonna uh, have one more question for Commissioner Barrosio and then we will move on. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Carr for Core for, for um, sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, two two uh, really quick questions. Um, one is how does how does uh, subpoena powers play into the oversight um, committee's responsibilities um, or powers that they may have? Um, and then two, um, I'm rereading the goals um, from your slides, and I wonder if the patterns are picked up. Um, what would be the best way to address more of the unseen cultural aspects of, um, of the policing agency, right? Because sometimes we can, we can measure outcomes and we could be preemptive with training, but what if it's a cultural thing? How does, how does an oversight committee get to those ingrained things? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. So let me start with the second one, then you can remind me of the first one when I forget. Um, you know, so part of that is really being able to examine training, um, you know, look at the, the materials, but also sit in on trainings, see what those trainings are. And that can be oversight board members, that can be staff, uh, hopefully both, and finding, um, just being able to examine those and seeing what's happening and, and offering opinions, making critiques, making suggestions, making recommendations. Uh, sometimes training will come to the attention of oversight agencies because of the types of complaints they get. Um, there's a great little anecdote that um, the vice president of NACOL 
who um, was the oversight person in Austin, Texas has, where they had, they were starting to get these complaints over and over again of people who were handcuffed mis improperly and they were injured. And they weren't following the department policy on handcuffing, which would have generally led to people not being injured. And it turned out when they started to do the auditing, because this was the end of, this is a police auditor, she had those authorities, that all of the officers who those complaints were about were all in the same academy class. And in that particular class, they brought someone in from outside the department to teach handcuffing. And that person wasn't actually familiar with the specific policies of the department. So all of those officers had been taught to do it the wrong way. So that's the kind of thing that um, you can find through those kind of audits, right? So you can examine train, you can watch training happen, you can look at the details, and then you can, and same with policies and procedures. And then you can also catch things through looking at broader patterns. And then I knew I would forget the first question, if you could please remind me. Yeah. No, thank you for the first part. The second one is how do how do subpoena powers play into uh, yes. um, is something that could be leveraged? Mm -hmm. So a great question also. And um, it's funny because I often say if this is not as applicable perhaps for San Jose, but people often get very focused on subpoena power. And I think the kind of in the popular mind, the idea is that if we have subpoena power, we're going to bring in the officers and they're going to have to testify under the pains and penalties of perjury to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God. And that is not what subpoena power does. Uh, because of the constitutional right and the Supreme Court decision called, um, in a case called Garrity, officers can be compelled to testify by their superior officers, but there are real limitations on what can happen with that information. It certainly can't be used in a criminal proceeding because they've been compelled to testify. Um, but what it can get you, you might be able to get um, other people, other witnesses. You might be able to get information. Now, again, ideally in an ordinance or in the charter or in even policies, there are requirements that the police organization has to cooperate and has to turn over records, that, they, that there should be unfettered access to records that are relevant for investigations. But where that doesn't happen, um, subpoenas can help. Uh, but I often say to people, you know, if if subpoena power is the thing that you're hung up on in terms of we, we, we're almost there, we have agreement within the, all the stakeholders, but this is the sticking point, you know, it's, it's not going to be the be all and end all that people often think it is. And on the other hand, if you can have subpoena power, you should get it. I mean, my agency has subpoena power. I do not believe it has been used in the last 25 years. And yet, if someone said, yeah, we're going to take away your subpoena power, I would say, I don't think that's a good idea, even though it has never come up in my time. So um, I think it's, it's an, it can be an important thing, but um, in a sense, it's something that it may not be what people often think it is. Hopefully that answers the question. No, perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. You're welcome. Well, Mr. Core, thank you so much for your time. We'll let you uh, get ready for some rest for the evening. And right. hopefully you can uh, sleep well, knowing that uh, you're a great benefit to, to this group of commissioners. So thanks again. And you're welcome. Um, thank you all. And thank yeah, you again sure for we'll, having me. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be following up if we have any more, more information, but uh, appreciate your time. You're very welcome. All right. And we are going to move on right to our next speaker. Our next speaker is... Mr. Aaron Zisser, and I hope I'm saying that right. I'll let you correct me if I'm not. Uh, uh, Mr. Zisser is the former uh, independent police officer at the city of San Jose and the current chief of staff at the Oakland Community Police Review Agency. Uh, Mr. Zisser, you've got about 30 minutes if, if you need it to, to share your thoughts um, about the IPA in San Jose. Uh, and I know you have a presentation and then we'll turn it over to Q&A with commissioners. Great, thank you for having me. Um, and it was great to hear from Mr. Kaur. I, I listened in on the whole presentation, appreciate his insights. Very much appreciate being invited to share my thoughts today. Um, I um, did put together my PowerPoint before seeing Brian, so there will be some repetition. I will try to avoid that and really make it as focused on San Jose, given that I'm, I'm sort of the San Jose uh, panelist today. So. Um, I just want to get started um, by introducing myself a little bit more. Uh, I was the independent police auditor in San Jose in 2017 and 2018. Um, 
before that, I uh, was a civil rights attorney at the US Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division, conducting pattern or practice investigations and monitoring of mostly jails and prisons and other, other agencies. Um, when I moved back to the Bay Area, I worked as a consultant on oversight and reform. I, uh, I consulted with Mike Janako on the BART oversight structure. I consulted for the San Francisco Oversight Agency. Uh, and probably uh, the biggest source of pride, I consulted for the Blue Ribbon Commission here in Santa Clara County uh, that resulted in the oversight agency that Mr. Janako now directs. Um, very important process, the Blue Ribbon Commission that I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and uh, I am the chief of staff at the Oakland Oversight Agency, CPRA. And I just wanna, just to be very clear, I am here in my individual capacity, not as a representative of my employer today. Um, so uh, I've worked in pattern of practice, reviewing systems uh, uh, at criminal justice agencies. I've done the auditor thing. I'm now at an investigative agency. I worked at the DA's office during criminal investigations of officer-involved shootings in San Francisco. So I, I, I've sort of touched each kind of um, oversight that Mr. Cord just presented about and that I'll discuss a little bit as well. I really do identify as a civil rights lawyer and I consider oversight to be a civil rights project. And I'll talk about what I think the goals of oversight ought to be, particularly in San Jose. Um, and it's gonna, you know, there's gonna be some overlap with what NACL, NACL is obviously an important organization. Uh, the organization on oversight in the country, but um, I have my own experience and my, my own perspective. Um, I'm also a San Jose resident still. Uh, uh, the, the union may not know that, may not like it, but I'm still here, I'm still around. Um, and, <laughs> and I was actually born in San Jose. Um, from, I grew up in Campbell and I'm very proud to be from here and I'm speaking to you today as a community member and a stakeholder. Um, just an overview of what I'll talk about today. I, I, I wanna open with something that Mr. Kaur, uh closed with, and I thought he articulated very, very nicely, but about what a community uh, engagement process ought to look like as we discuss these issues. I'll talk about the goals of oversight. Um, I'll touch on the oversight models. I'm not, I won't spend too much time because Brian covered that in detail. And then I will talk about some of the key key principles of oversight. He talked about 13, I'll talk about six. Um, and so they're um, just again, focusing on San Jose. This is the most, by far the most text heavy slide that I have. It's the only text heavy slide that I have. And I just wanna make sure and, and get it just right. Um, so, and, and Brian alluded to this or talked about it uh, quite well, as I said, um, just as oversight should center the community, so should, reform of oversight, so, so should the process that leads to improved oversight. Um, and I hope that this commission hosts a broad range of community leaders, that is San Jose leaders, um, black leaders, Latino leaders, uh, leaders from the disability community, uh, families who have experienced officer uh, involved shootings or other uh, police violence. And I just wanna draw everyone's attention to the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee, it's a mouthful, but it is the task force on reimagining Public safety in San Jose, and it, they were in the news, uh, you know, in the last few months because there was a walkout after a few of their sessions. Uh, the black leader, many of the black leaders on that task force, walked out because it was not representing a process that the community uh, would, really felt was the right process. It was not community led. Um, it was there were all sorts of problems with it, and because of their advocacy they've completely reinvented this task force and it is community led. It will be chaired by community members, community leaders. The selection of the members of the committee will be uh, nominated by community-based organizations in San Jose, representing a whole range of different kinds of stakeholder groups. Um, their recommendations are not gonna be filtered through the city manager's office, but will go directly to city council. This is your stakeholder process for recommending changes to oversight. And if your commission isn't listening to that commission, then you're missing a huge piece. So I hope that these processes can line up in a way that really benefits from the extraordinary work and extraordinary advocacy that that group is doing. Um, and then just the last thing on this side is, you know, these are just my views. Um, I've talked with a lot of community leaders in San Jose. I've been around uh, different communities, um, but 
this panel, which is a great panel, I have a huge respect for Paul Parker, I have huge respect for Mike Janaco, for Brian Core, but hearing directly from community leaders is critical. With that, I'll move into the substance. Um, so I, I, I broke down the goals as I see them into, uh, you know, just uh, three, three goals. I know Brian presented a number of goals. It really, you know, there's really an outcry when, when there's a, uh, a dramatic incident involving an officer involved shooting or an in custody death. And there's a huge interest in deterring those worst incidents or the worst abuses. And so one of the goals of oversight has to be accountability uh, for those incidents when, when they're unlawful or improper under policy, um, but to also provide transparency around the incidents that are exonerated as lawful or compliant with policy. The second goal should be reaching beyond just individual incidents and thinking about systemic reform, culture change. Um, you know, Brian talked about preventing uh, future incidents, um, building in systems that, uh, that uh, keep the police department on the right track. And then the third, uh, Brian also talked about this, about procedural justice and credibility with the community. And I talk about credibility with the community, that if we're going to have systemic reform, if we're going to exonerate officers for officer-involved shootings, oversight has to have credibility. And we'll talk about all the ingredients uh, for, or a number of the ingredients for um, ensuring credibility in the community. Um, I, as IPA in San Jose, I often got questioned by community leaders who said, how are you really independent? You report to politicians uh, you know, who have their own interests. How are you independent? You're part of the city structure. Um, and so having credibility um, is, is critical. If you're gonna push for reform, you have to be able to sell that reform at the end of the day. Um, people need to buy in. Um, I do not think, this is, <laughs> this is something that I just carry with me. I do not think the job of oversight is to build confidence between the police and the community. That is the police's job to build confidence with the community. The job of oversight is to point out to the police department where they are doing things that is undermining the confidence that the community might have in the police department. But the oversight should never be cover. It should never be uh, you know, an excuse. Uh, it, it really needs to hold the feet of the police department to the fire and, and hold them accountable for making the changes that will build trust in the community. Um, I, I, I know, you know, we, you know, we talk a lot about transparency. Transparency is not a goal. It's a tool for building, um, solutions, uh, for building reform, um, for, uh, credibility, uh, for improved practices. And at the end of the day, the goals are really about improving practices from a constitutional perspective, from a best practices perspective in terms of how the police should interact with members in the community. Um, and again, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I addressed these kinds of issues as a civil rights lawyer and oversight exists because there is a, a, a demand for ensuring constitutional policing and preventing harms caused by unconstitutional policing. Um, Brian talked about the models. I'm not gonna belabor this. Um, I, you know, I, I, this basically emulates NACOL, I use slightly different terminology and actually, unfortunately, you know, Brian uh, did a great presentation. He doesn't know San Jose intimately. I, I don't fault him for that, but we are not actually a, an auditor model the way NACOL thinks of an auditor model. We are a review model. I call that the auditor model because most independent police auditor agencies operate very similarly to how our IPA office operates. We do not do systemic reviews. We have recently been granted expanded, uh, expanded access under Measure G, but it's very limited. The main thrust of the IPA office is to review internal affairs investigations, not to look at all the various records that might exist, all the body-worn camera footage that might exist, all the uh, trainings that might exist. And I'm gonna talk about my experience with that in a little while. I, I did try to do some of those things and it was not easy because that's not the model uh, for the IPA office. Um, but the inspector general and monitor model, um, that, that's what I'll be referring to when I talk about systemic reviews, pattern of practice, broad access beyond just the internal affairs investigations or the accountability process, the discipline process. 
Uh, there's uh, some benefits uh, that I, I'm not going to get a lot into with the inspector general model with respect to transparency. There's a lot of laws in California that protect uh, discipline related records from being released. The San Jose IPA office does a great job of releasing as much as they possibly can. Um, I think they're a leader nationally in, in, um, adver in publishing material about the internal affairs cases, but the police officer bill of rights really does uh, protect a lot of those records from disclosure. The inspector general model does not have the same constraints. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the commission sort of model separately um, in a little bit. Um, one of the nice things about the inspector general model is that it's not just about individual officers. It's about sort of department accountability, systemic accountability. Brian said some really important things about officers feeling like, you know, they're spotlighted. And the, the, the IG model is an opportunity to not always highlight an individual incident, but to talk about where a department may be even failing the officers, not giving them adequate training, not protecting them well enough, um, putting them into dangerous situations where they're really, they don't have psychology degrees to Commissioner Sanchez's earlier point. Um, and I appreciate that point, but I think he was being, uh, you know, I, I think he was being, you know, a little bit uh, tongue in cheek about that, but it's a very important, serious point. Um, just uh, some examples of agencies of jurisdictions in each of these models. Um, Oakland has, my, the, my agency is the Community Police Review Agency. We do our own investigations parallel to internal affairs investigations. Um, uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, similar. I have San Jose there in the middle model. Um, and then uh, some examples, um, Oakland is developing or is hiring the next, the first, the inaugural inspector general uh, in a, in a, for their new office of the inspector general. Um, San Francisco got audit authority, which is sort of IG type authority to look at broader policies and practices. Uh, Brian talked about the, the, um, the 13 key principles. I am not going to go through them, but what I will highlight are a few. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to reframe them a little bit. And you don't need to remember which of these, I'll go through them each, but um, a lot of the ones I highlight in red sort of incorporate other uh, principles listed here. Um, so for example, public engage or uh, community involvement and uh, independence have a lot to do with procedural justice. Uh, community involvement obviously has a lot to do with community uh, outreach, um, access. I, I just talked about sort of um, the IG model and um, and transparency. So we'll talk about that. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to spend time sort of repeating what Brian said, but uh, I'll go through a few of these. These are the ones that these are the sort of six that I'm going to highlight um, that were just highlighted in red. Uh, community involvement. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the police commission or board uh, access, which is really about the IG model as I see it. Authority. Um, as opposed to advisory. So Brian talked about sort of clear authority. I'm gonna talk about what, about actual authority. What authority does, should, a should an agency actually have? Um, the qualifications for um, an oversight director, uh, staffing resource needs and independence. So um, with respect to community involvement, um, as I said, this is really a, a, about establishing a commission. I know there's a lot of interest in San Jose and whether a commission should be established. Um, when I was the IPA, I had to do a lot of community outreach. I loved it. I loved doing community outreach and engagement. I talked to everyone I could, um, sometimes to a fault, as some people might have observed at the time. But, um, but, I, but I place a huge premium on that, and most oversight practitioners do. Um, but involving the community directly, having agency <laughs> um, over what happens in the oversight structure is, is a totally different thing, right? They get to call the shots. They get to set the priorities. They have access. They have authority. Um, they have resources. That's very different from me going to somebody and being sort of the subject going to the object, right, um, as the director. 
uh, I tried to make it as 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 uh, inclusive as as much a partnership as I could, turning over town halls to the community-based organizations. But it was still incumbent on me, and not every oversight director is going to take the same approach. Um, and of course, it's not a it's not an either or thing. You still do community outreach, but you have this constant venue every two weeks. You're meeting as a board. You're reporting to the board. You're accountable to the board, um, and uh, and and you know, really um, listening to the conversation that the, these community representatives are leading, as opposed to the director having to be the one sort of spurring the conversation. Um, San Jose is, frankly, at least in our part of the country, an outlier among large cities. Uh, we don't have a police commission. All these other agencies and many more do, uh, all these jurisdictions. Um, I just started my tenure as a library commissioner for the city of San Jose. I'm very proud of it. Um, big consumer of the libraries in, in San Jose, one of the great services we have in the city. Why do we have a library commission? Why do we have a commission on everything under the sun, but not a police commission? It, it just doesn't make any sense at this stage in, in where we're at in the conversation about policing. Um, there's just no reason not to have a police commission in some form. It doesn't have to have the same contours as other commissions. And I'll talk about, well, a little bit about what those uh, contours look like. But in, in, in Oakland and in San Francisco, they have a lot of authority. There was a question earlier about the selection process for commissions. And so I just want to touch on that quickly. In Oakland, as an example, Oakland decided to sort of innovate on other existing models like San Francisco, which um, the appointments are by the city council members and the mayor in, in there, it's the county board of supervisors and the mayor, not city council, but in Oakland, the mayor gets a minority of the appointments and a community panel gets a majority of the appointments. So there's another panel of community activists, community leaders who get to nominate uh, members and present that slate of nominees to the city council and the city council votes yay or nay on that slate of nominees. Um, so allowing for a majority of the uh, commissioners to be selected directly from the community is, is an important innovation. Uh, access, um, again, sort of thinking about the models, this is really for me represents a shift to the inspector general model as opposed to our auditor model. Um, all records, unredacted records, Measure G provides for some redacted records, which is just ludicrous. Um, uh, access to personnel, being able to talk to leadership, um, doing a pattern of practice, systemic reviews, um, and reports about findings with respect to those reviews. Um, any records on any topic at any time, um, it's part of the city. They can access the records they provide for appropriate confidentiality. They don't disclose uh, records inappropriately. Um, and uh, very, very similar to how the US Department of Justice does their pattern of practice reviews, um, basically identical. Now, my experience in San Jose, I did try to push the envelope a little. I tried to address some topics on you know, crisis intervention, resp police response to domestic and sexual violence, community policing. And so I had a series of conversations with police leadership um, on those topics. But it was a process to get those sit downs with those leaders, including, by the way, Shawnee Williams, who was in one of those meetings about responses to gender based violence. And once I had those sit downs, they were fantastic. I had great conversations, but it was a battle to get into those rooms, to get at those tables with those leaders, to have those really helpful conversations, to learn about their budget challenges, to learn about their staffing challenges, to learn about uh, the trainings uh, that officers received on certain topics. Um, and um, it should not be a battle. These should, this should be a partnership with the police department uh, to educate the public, um, to educate the city council. Um, and I saw myself as a vehicle for providing that information out uh, to those other stakeholders. Um, I was very reliant as a result on public data provided by the police department. And that had huge pitfalls for me. And I ran, in, I ran into a buzzsaw when it came to that. It was really unfair for the police auditor's office to, to be that constrained if we were expected to provide information to the public. Um, so uh, 
now Brian said a lot about you know there's no one right model for any for for all communities and I, I generally agree with that but there are some key ingredients and that's what I'm talking about I do think you have to have some level of independence you have to have some level of access you have to have some level of authority and so on um, and without those things you're not going to be a credible oversight agency um, the IG model is growing, including the Bay Area. Brian talked about the proliferation of this model. Um, I mentioned San Francisco recently adding Audit Authority, Oakland's new IG office. And it doesn't need to be a troubled agency that's under a consent decree or has had a horrible incident. Um, actually, the whole point of the IG model, one of the big points of the IG model is to prevent those things from happening, to prevent systemic problems and consent decrees and bad officer-involved shootings. Um, and right now, for large departments, there's just no excuse in the wake of George Floyd, but you know, we go back to Ferguson, we go back way be before that. Um, why, why is San Jose any different from any other big city? It, it's really not. It's got a big police department, it's got a diverse community, it's got the same issues that any police department of its size experiences. And actually, there is a San Jose specific argument for robust oversight. There aren't too many places that have the um, unfortunate distinction of having had a federal trial, a civil trial, establishing a wrongful shooting of a community member by a police officer. San Jose has that unfortunate distinction. 2016 shooting resulted in a finding by a federal jury of a, uh, an unlawful shooting of an 18-year-old on his front lawn while he was experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, didn't get a lot of news. Um, and I've met with that family multiple times. I, 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 I sat with them while they've grieved. Um, I honor that, uh, that their, uh, advocacy, their, their experience, uh, the, the, the difficulty of, of going to court to prove their case. And, and they show, they proved, um, that the shooting was unlawful. Um, but San Jose has also had documented disparities. Uh, back in about the same time, 2016, 2017, the University of Texas did a study on disparities in uh, uses of force uh, and other things uh, uh, by the San Jose Police Department. And then we all know that San Jose was just one of the spotlighted agencies around the country when it came to their handling of the George Floyd protests. Um, and we have whoever is typing mute their... Um... Mute their microphone, please. If everyone can mute their microphone, thank you. But so I think there is a San Jose specific argument for this type of uh, model. Um, I'll try to talk over the, the background noise. Um, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that we do away with the IPA model. It can be folded into a broader IG model, a broader IG can still review in what internal affairs is doing, just like an important review all the other operational aspects of the police department. And there's some really cool elements to the IPA model in San Jose. There's contemporaneous monitoring of investigations. I was able to sit in and interviews that IA conducted of officers. I was able to suggest questions for officers. That's within the authority. Um, and I, if, I, if, we dis, if we disagreed with the police department's findings, we could appeal that to the chief. We could appeal it to the city manager. Um, that was an important process, um, but, uh, you know, it not always utilized, not always utilized, but uh, important. I, I tried to utilize it uh, as much as possible. Sorry, I'm toggling back and forth to see my notes. Um, so I wanted to, moving on from access to authority, I'm going to try to breeze through this because I know we're running short on time, although my portion started a little late, so I hope you'll uh, give me a few extra minutes. Um, as I said, you know, I was able to appeal uh, findings to um, the city manager, um, and um, in Oakland, the CPRA is able to appeal to the police commission. That's what we're talking, that's the kind of thing we're talking about with authority. Um, access is authority too. Are, do you have to ask for access and just expect to cooperate, hope for cooperation, or is it mandated? Um, uh, there's also a question of how much authority the, the policy recommendations have. 
uh, the IPA in San Jose makes recommendations and that's all they are. They're just recommendations. In Oakland, by contrast, just for example, um, the commission uh, makes proposes policy changes. And if the city council does not act to overrule those changes, after a certain period of time, they become, uh, they, they become, they go into effect. Uh, the city council can overrule the commission, but um, it puts them in an awkward position. And so it puts sort of political pressure on them about whether they're really gonna overrule the police commission that studied the issue and hopefully worked with the inspector general to come up with those and with the community to come up with those policy recommendations. Um, it's very, very difficult to track which policy recommendations from the IPA office have been uh, implemented by the department. And it's very hard to also monitor that because of the access issues that we already talked about. Uh, just a quick uh, note about selection and qualifications of an oversight director in particular. Um, there was a very, very robust process for my hiring. I interviewed with multiple panels of community leaders representing a very broad range of stakeholder groups. There was a ton of community input. I was just thrilled with the process. Um, this should be codified. This should be required. This is not currently part of the charter. Uh, it is not how every IPA has been selected. And I think it's a really important process. The union was at the table, police leadership were involved, uh, you know, city council members were part of the process directly. Um, so very broad range of stakeholders. Um, same with the qualifications. Somebody asked, one of the commissioners here asked about what kinds of qualifications for commissioners. Uh, well, there also should be enumerated qualifications for an agency director. Um, I'm not gonna get into the specifics about that, but I think, you know, um, whether the person is former law enforcement, obviously that's a very common criterion that's looked at. Uh, some places don't want a former law enforcement officer, um, certainly not a former law enforcement officer in that, from that jurisdiction, um, maybe civil rights background, uh, oversight, certainly experience with oversight. Um, and I already talked about sort of a public process for uh, vetting the candidates. Um, staffing and resources. Um, as Brian mentioned, the investigative model is very resource intensive. You need a lot of investigators. The IG model, frankly, would not require that much more staffing than what you already have in the IP office. You would probably need a data analyst, a statistician, but you already have auditors who know how to look at systems and processes and policies. Uh, and by the way, you have an outstanding team at the IPA office. Um, it really is top notch. Um, and, and it would not be a, 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 you know, and, and by the way, you know, it would of course increase their caseload, but one thing that the IPA office has been doing that they don't need to do, but I think it's great that they've been able to do it. They are not required under the charter to, to audit every single IA investigation. They have to audit every use of force investigation, but they only have to audit something like 20%, I think of other incidents and they they audit almost 100 percent so they could do a true audit of a sample of internal affairs investigations and create bandwidth to look at other systems and processes um, under the ig model um, independence um, you know there was discussion about independence from a city council i reported directly to the city council it was political. Um, I'm not. I, there, I have some good stories about how political it was, but believe me, it was political. Um, I was naive about just how political. Um, very little room for error, um, and you kind of needed a politician and not a lawyer or an expert. And I think having a police commission that creates insulation from the electeds is a really important uh, innovation. Um, you know, politicians are never truly independent from the police. They may not get the police union's endorsement, but they may be interested in not having the police union speak out against them, right? That's important. They may not even want the police union endorsement, but they certainly don't want the union coming out hard against them. So they may, you know, they may be very careful about what they do. Um, independence is a huge part of credibility for the community. I mentioned this earlier. I got asked about it all the time. Um, there's also the removal process, not just the appointment process, but how an uh, IPA or a director is removed. Actually, San Jose has a great process to protect for against arbitrary removal, uh, very, very uh, strict uh, requirements, um, but again, politicized um, because of the current structure. Other ingredients for independence, basically all the other things we've talked about. You can't be truly independent if you don't have the resources to do the work that you wanna do. Um, you can't be independent if you're constantly begging 
the police department for records? Are you really gonna be objective in reviewing those records? You're gonna be trusted to be objective. Uh, you can't be independent if you don't have authority, if you're just advisory. Um, so all of these things enhance independence. It's not just the structure. It's not just who you report to, although that is really critical. Uh, I'm almost done, says conclusion. Um, goals, uh, uh, just returning to the goals of oversight. These are the same goals I mentioned earlier, and I just wanna go to this last slide that uh, matches the models with the goals. Um, officer accountability, the model there is investigative or auditor, audit investigations. I think the investigative model, as Brian said, is really something you hear the community demanding a lot. They just don't even trust the auditor model because um, it's the police department that's done the investigation. Um, it was not easy to appeal to the city manager. I, I, I like Dave Sykes a lot. I think he's a great city manager. He didn't know anything about policing. That's not his bailiwick. He comes from public works. I get it. And it was not comfortable for him to evaluate police misconduct cases. Um, it's just not a, it, the auditor model doesn't work as well as having an independent investigative model. And in a city the size of, of San Jose, um, it, it's, it's an appropriate model. You, I mean, it's not a small, uh, in fact, we have more police officers in San Jose by far than Oakland does, and they have an investigative model. Uh, we have fewer than San Francisco, but more than Oakland. Uh, in terms of the inspector general model, that sort of matches what I mentioned about systemic reform, culture change, um, and then sort of layering both these models with a commission to ensure that those, um, those changes happen to hold the oversight agencies accountable themselves. And then lastly, um, procedural justice and credibility with the community, that, that's where the, a commission can really be a big help. And I put these all next to each other because you know Brian talked about hybrid models and most places are hybrid models. Oakland has all three of these things. Oakland has an investigative model, a commission, and an inspector general's office, three separate entities. In San Francisco, you have a single entity doing the, the inspector general and investigations, and that's fine, um, and a commission that, that oversees those functions. Um, so it can, it can vary how you do it. I think um, it, it, in many respects, it makes sense to separate them because they really are different um, functions, investigative and, and the pattern or practice work. Um, but I, I don't think that's a, a you know, I certainly don't have strong feelings uh, on that. But it's not an either or. And, um, and it's important to think about the goals along with how do we get to each of those important goals. Can we get to systemic reform with just police, with just the IPA model? I don't think so. Can we get to addressing the most critical incidents with just an inspector general model? Absolutely not. The community wants those incidents investigated or at least reviewed very closely every time they happen. So that's uh, my presentation. Uh, I'm sorry I went a little bit over, but only a few minutes. Um, and I am more than happy to take questions. It, you know, if you want to ask me direct about my San Jose specific experience, I probably didn't get that into that as much as I would have liked or as much as some of you would like, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Sisser, and uh, no problem going a little over. Yeah, I would love to hear from commissioners, um, and, and the intention was to, to have someone here that can speak to San Jose uh, more specifically. So, um, Commissioner Sanchez, your hand is still up. Did you have an additional question right now? Okay. All right. So I'll go to Commissioner Percival. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Lawrence and Aaron. Uh, really appreciate your time. And I, I did want to kind of go towards your San Jose experience. because I think both you and Brian offer the commission a lot of really helpful thoughts on structures and um, what, a, what a new system would look like. The, the um, IG model, I think, has been really um, effective in terms of uh, a lot, you know, the prison system in California, for example, although you said, you know, it doesn't have to be under any sort of consent decree to, 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 to need this and benefit from this. But it seems to me that if we were going to design a system from scratch, I think there would be a lot of support from this for this. But the problem always is, it's like we're not starting from scratch. We're, we're starting from, you know, existing structures. And that's where often the resistance comes in. It's more of a political problem, seems to me. And so I'm curious in your experience, what, what kind of advice would you have for a commission like ours, where really we need to, in order to, if we're going to advocate for change, and we're hearing from members of the community who are really advocating for that, and there's been years of frustration around that. So how would we go about doing that? Like, how would we you know, bring, also what Brian was saying, more community support, 
support among police for change. And it sounds like you ran into some roadblocks, uh, you know, in your work when you were here in the city. So, so thanks. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I'm not, uh, at, I'm, you know, I'm not politically savvy in, in the way that perhaps I, I should be. Um, I, and so I'm probably not the best person, but I will, I, I, I'll sort of go back to what I opened with, which is groundswell, which is community voices, bringing in a ton of people to, to, um, to echo what, what some of you are trying to do here. Um, you should not be going at this alone. Um, and uh, it should be informed by community. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, we recently saw the mayor speak out against uh, Sheriff Smith, um, and uh, I certainly appreciated his points, but I think we got to look at our own jurisdiction first and um, make sure we're not speaking out of both sides of our mouths. Um, the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission for the jail back in 2016, 2015, 2016, um, was, was a huge effort, community led by a very credible chair in Lodoris Cordell, uh, former judge, and with some great stakeholder groups at the table, with a great structure in terms of who was a voting member, who were non-voting members, getting all the right government agencies at the table. And there ought to be a robust process. And that's why I mentioned the task force on reimagining public safety. They're, they have all the right stakeholders. I hope they will have the, the government stakeholders at the table as non-voting members. I believe they will. And there needs to be a pr very public process, put a lot of pressure. Um, but there's no reason why we should go through that process in Santa Clara County and somehow think in San Jose we're exempt from that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same place. Um, we're a large uh, police department. Um, we need to highlight those issues that San Jose has had. I, I don't think San Jose is any worse than any other place. I'm not saying they are, but we did not look good during the George Floyd protests. Uh, there were a lot of problems. It was not uh, a bad cop here, a bad cop there. These were systemic issues with community leaders, commissioners from city commissions getting, um, having, suffering very serious injuries as a result of their participation in those protests and, and the uses of force that were, that police uh, used against them. So um, I think really examining that recent history, uh, the longer history, um, and uh, where we're at in terms of a national conversation um, but getting, we have amazing community leaders in this city and something, I went to the Barack Obama Boulevard uh, inauguration this weekend, and it was so thrilling to see the black community in particular come together uh, at something that there's a lot of pride about um, to rename an important artery uh, through our city after someone that really inspired a lot of people. It, it's a community that represents only 2% of the city's population and yet has this incredibly outsized uh, influence and they fought for it. They meet all the time. They lead conversations in the community all the time about these issues. Uh, I'm so thrilled that Rick Callender is on this commission uh, and I'm grateful that he thought of me for this presentation. I, you know, we have resources like him. We have resources like, uh, I mean, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet. We have the Latino organizations. These are powerful organizations that are leading these conversations that have a lot to say on these topics. Silicon Valley Debug has done a phenomenal job with support from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation of organizing families that have been directly impacted. Their voices are going to be directly represented on this reimagining task force, and they should be. So it's just about inviting those folks to the table and giving them um, the opportunity to share their stories and their views. Um, it's not rocket science. And I appreciate the question. I know you're giving me an opportunity to, to share my thoughts, but I think you know. I think you know what the process looks like. We've already seen it in, in Santa Clara County and we're seeing it again with this task force. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, I'm it makes me proud to be a San Jose resident. So let's just utilize that. Let's tap into this, this amazing expertise we have in this city. Great, thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Uh, did you take your hand down, Commissioner Matsumura? I think she was trying to speak. Uh, okay. I was double oh. muted because I couldn't, <laughs> it, it, anyway. I was just thanking you for the presentation and uh, the passion for San Jose. 
And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very compelled by your argument about the importance and value of um, and legitimacy of the Reimagine Task Force itself and the process. And here we are on this commission with a very short timeline and um, the power to make recommendations about charter changes. And so I wonder, you know, you laid out a number of, of um, recommendations or possible avenues to explore, um, some of which could be policy changes. I'm wondering if there are particular areas that you see, I think you, you mentioned one, but I was hoping you could expand upon what particularly um, would be important to include in the charter or otherwise in the, in the scope of our commission's work. I mean, I, I really tried to focus on a few. I appreciate the question, Commissioner. I was really trying to focus on a few key items. I, I mean, it's really only a handful. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go back. I, I left the slides up on purpose. And I, I know maybe it's easier not to have them. But I mean, the, this is what I'm talking about. Um, uh, a commission, an IG model, um, some, you know, retain the authority that we already have make sure that authority translates with the commission, um, having, you know, I think those are, those are the big ones, <laughs> I would say, you know, those are the top three, they're on the top there. Independence will happen because of a commission. Independence will happen through these other things. Um, it's always gonna be a budget fight in terms of staffing and resources, but the IP office is currently staffed pretty dang well. I mean, they, they're pretty strong. Um, my former colleagues may disagree, but I felt like we had a great team. Um, you can always use more, always use more, but I think there's there's some wiggle room there. Um, and then I think having a process for selecting the agency director is really important. Um, you know, I, I left, you know, I left under less than ideal circumstances. And so they tapped a, a, a real expert, Siobhan Nuri, who has been there a long time. Uh, and, you know, she may be just the right person for the job, uh, you know, but there was not a public process to choose my successor. And I think that was a mistake. Um, and I think that ought to be codified so that mistake doesn't get made again. Uh, that might be unusual. I don't know if that shows up in other jurisdictions as having something codified along those lines, but um, San Jose has certainly practiced that when they selected Walter Katz, you know, similar process as I understand it. He was an outstanding selection, uh, didn't last uh, very long through, you know, no fault of his own, um, but, um, you know, I, I think those are the, sort of the key ingredients. I think the access piece, I'm all, that's my, that's what I preach the most is the access piece. But I think if you're doing this without having a commission, it's just such a conspicuous omission when we have commissions for everything else. So I just go back to that. I hope that answers your question, but I, I really tried to boil it down to the, the key ingredients um, for me. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Siegel, I saw your hand up uh, just a m moment there. Oh, I, I'll, I'll let others ask first. If there's time, I'll ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I see Commissioner Sui Tran and Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Tran? Thank you. Uh, so two quick questions. Uh, sorry, one quick question and one a little bit longer. So I'll ask the quick question first. Just offhand, do you know the difference between the size of the um, oversight office uh, in Oakland compared to what it is in San Jose. I'm, I'm just curious about the difference well, there. Well, I'm the chief of staff, so I hope I know the size of our oh, office. Well, then, thank you. Um, the investigative agency, it's, it's 12, uh, 12 members of the staff, but we are seriously understaffed, seriously understaffed. And the IG will eventually have, um, I want to say four or five people to begin with, um, which is which is probably close to adequate for the IG function. And by the way, the commission uh, itself in Oakland has their own chief of staff, a separate staffer, high level staffer, who was just brought on um, to staff them directly, which is a huge resource as well. So more than like double the size of what we have here in San Jose? Yeah, but with very different function, but yes. yes. Okay, okay. And then the second question, because I, I know you mentioned, you talked a bit about kind of uh, reporting to the council and, and how that kind of politicizes things. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm actually kind of curious about your impression of how you would care, compare, let's say, the, the planning commission to what you would envision here uh, for the civilian oversight, because um, at least, you know, through personal experience and through some anecdotes, uh, I think there's a, we can all acknowledge that there's politics at play too uh, when we talk about the planning commission. Uh, so do you believe that that level of political, I guess, 
adv uh, environment is okay compared to just going reporting directly to the Alberta City Council, or do you believe that the commission itself can be structured in a way that minimizes politicization? I mean, that is a great question. Uh, we and and I, by the way, um, Commissioner Tran, I should say, I, I appreciate your leadership in so many areas, and I also want to thank, by the way, Commissioner Siegel for your leadership on on this issue. Um, and putting together a great, great panel of experts. Um, very impressive. Um, so um, really, again, a, a real source of pride to see this process happening. Um, I, I I just, Commissioner Tran, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask about comparing it to the Planning Commission. Um, you know, I, I get what you're talking about for the most part, I get the gist. Um, you know, it's hard to predict what would happen. Um, you know, I, I will say that Oakland's police commission, um, they do really important work. They really do great work, but it doesn't always get a ton of attention and it gets much less attention than I would think it would. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, the selection process is different as I described it from certainly what happens at the Planning Commission which is uh, the appointments are made by individual council members as I understand it. Um, the commission in Oakland again operates differently where uh, just under half are appointed by the mayor and the rest are appointed by a community panel. Um, and so it is, you know, less political in that sense. Uh, I will, I, I do wanna say uh, the mayoral appointments on the Oakland Commission are very, very, genuine advocates for police reform they they're not i mean they're still community leaders on on the, the, these issues and that may be because of the character of oakland i'm not sure but um it's hard to predict i i think um it is it is so political i mean i, I we could have a whole conversation maybe you and i should have a whole conversation about my experience working with the city council um as ipa but um I can't imagine that having a commission wouldn't address some of that politicization. I think it absolutely has to. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, uh, Commissioner Fuentes. This will be really quick because I want to make sure Commissioner Siegel has a chance to speak. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your outstanding presentation. I learned so much tonight and I also want to give you my personal commitment that we will do everything possible to, to follow your advice and use everything you shared with us tonight to make sure we make outstanding recommendations that will help our city. But more than anything, I just really want to thank you for everything you're doing and you did in our community. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Appreciate that. All right, uh, Commissioner Barrosio, and then we'll go to Commissioner Siegel. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, my question is similar to the one I asked um, to, to our previous uh, guest speaker. Um, if you can say something about the, the subpoena power um, element, right, to this, um, to, to any citizen oversight um, model, um, in your experience, how do you think that would benefit uh, pros and cons of the city of San Jose um, with your experience of uh, working here in the city of San Jose and in other parts of the Bay Area? Yeah, I mean, I am, uh, you, you have the great benefit of having Mike Janako on after me. He can answer this question better than anybody. Um, and uh, I mean, you, you really have the expert on, uh, on all things police oversight and police practices in Mike Janako. Um, and we're lucky as a county to have him as our director of oversight for the sheriff's office. Um, I'm personally grateful to Mike for everything he has shared with me and, and been a support to me. So um, I, I encourage you to direct that question to him. I will say um, it's a little bit of a mystery to me why we would need subpoena authority. So I'll let Mike correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, the subpoena authority is really important in a county structure because the the sheriff's office is independent from the county board of supervisors and so you may need cross-jurisdictional um, sort of authority to access records and so forth within a unitary city structure you should not need that it's another agency having access to its own records these are city records they're not police records they're city records 
So it's just the city having access to their own records. Uh, the city attorney's office would, would facilitate that probably to some extent. One thing I should mention uh, to Commissioner Tran's question is that the Oakland structure has the commissioner, the commission has its own counsel as well. Um, and so does my agency, the CPRA, we have our own lawyer. And so we get legal advice on these kinds of questions on access on, on all sorts of things. And so that's another thing that you, you could do to equip the oversight agency and the commission with their own legal advisors so that they're not, there's not a conflict of interest, so to speak, between the city attorney's office, which is defending the interests of the city writ large and the interests of the commission. So, um, but I, I just don't think, I mean, you heard Brian say that they've not used their subpoena authority in 25 years. It's just not the thing I would focus on. I think it's a distraction to be quite honest. I, I think it's really beside the point. That's my answer. Perfect, thank you. But I will absolutely let Mike tell me I'm totally wrong. <laughs> if, if he said, and if he does, then he's right and I'm wrong. But I, I'm pretty sure. All right, we have, a, we have quite a, a little line of questions for him <laughs> queuing up. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I'll go to Commissioner Gilman, then we'll get back to you, Commissioner Siegel. We, we have time to hear from you both. Commissioner Gilman. Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. I'm concerned about the level of uh, staffing we have today, the number of uniformed police officers, and I'm concerned about our ability to attract and retain top talent. And it seems to be not only a problem here in San Jose, but one that's becoming a national problem. It appeared to me that over the last year, particularly with the protests that occurred downtown, that frankly, the police department got a lot of unfair press from my perspective. So my question is, how do we balance a commission with the need to keep morale up and retain and attract uh, top quality personnel? I mean, I just think Oakland is such a case study in this. Um, you have a chief uh, in Oakland who is from Oakland. Uh, he's African-American. He uh, has deep roots in Oakland and a chair of the commission who helped appoint the chief, by the way, that's another one of their powers is they help decide who gets to be chief, um, which is an important power. Um, and they have a very uh, strong partnership. Uh, some have criticized her for, you know, not having enough separation. But when the police is, are doing the things right, when they're asking for resources to, in Oakland, we're having a very serious spike in homicides. And that's been a huge part of the conversation about resources for the police department. So I think the police and the chief comes every two weeks to report to the commission about crime statistics, about resource concerns, about staffing. And it's a platform for the police department too, to, to, um, to air those concerns, um, to have those conversations. So I think it needs to be respectful and it needs to be supportive. Oakland's under a consent, an 18 year old consent decree, federal consent decree. Um, they are almost there. I think they are just 5% below full staffing. Um, you know, uh, San Jose actually has, their numbers are comparatively high relative to your recent years. Um, they're, they're pretty well staffed compared to previous years. So yes, there, there's been way fewer applications. Uh, I don't know if things will swing back once the the sort of this collective trauma of the, the George Floyd um, uh, murder and, and subsequent protests where, where's, where's off, I don't know. There will be another event, no question, at some point. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I think that it, it is about that partnership. In a place like San Jose, there's a lot of support for the police department. That's why this is such a challenge to change the, the, the oversight structure. Um, and I think in a place like San Jose, um, you know, I'll just close. I don't want to be interpreted to be a, a, agreeing by through my silence with your your the prefatory remark you made. I, I respect your opinion, Commissioner Gilman, but of course, I think the opposite. I think San Jose didn't get enough bad press about what happened um, during the protests. It was handled horrendously, um, and they deserved every bit of the criticism they got and more. Um, and if there had been a more robust oversight structure there would have been a lot more opportunity to highlight exactly what went wrong um, rather than letting the union and the police department and the mayor drive the narrative about what the problems were. And that's exactly what happened. It got politicized and a lot of it got brushed under the, under the, the carpet. 
Okay. Commissioner Siegel, last question for Mr. Zisser. Thank you so much, Mr. Zisser, for, um, for speaking to us. It was really very informative. Thank you for representing um, the, the, the office in San Jose. Um, I'm wondering if you know why the Reimagining Commission is only allowed to exist for six months. Why is it closing after six months? Uh, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, that's a temporary task force tasked with uh, making recommendations about changing uh, practices, policies and practices uh, in terms of policing and alternatives to policing. It's not supposed to go on ad nauseum. Um, and, you know, they've already seen significant delays uh, just getting started more than a year after the George Floyd murder um, is already a significant delay compared to, say, Oakland, which got started much quicker. Um, wasn't as good a process uh, as what San Jose has now put together, but um, I think there's a real sense of urgency. Um, and um, I hope that that task force will have some discretion about whether to extend, they need to extend things if that becomes necessary. I, I think they'll probably have a bully pulpit at least to advocate for that. Um, and I don't know if they'll have uh, actual authority to do that, but um, I think it remains to be seen whether they're really constrained in that way. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zisser. Really appreciate your uh, passion for, for San Jose, your experience and, and all the insight you shared with the commission. Thanks for and, having uh, me, appreciate yeah. it. You're welcome. All right, we have uh, two more speakers that we're gonna bundle into a, a mini panel um, for uh, expediency, but I think there's gonna be a lot of questions for, for both of these folks. So uh, representing uh, some uh, practices from other communities, we have Paul R. Parker III, the executive officer of the San Diego County Citizens Law Enforcement Re Review Board. And we also have um, Michael Giannacco, the principal of the OIR group and the current city of Davis independent police officer. Welcome to you both. And why don't we start with Mr. Parker? And um, we have about 15 minutes for, for both of you to share some thoughts um, for this commission based on what you've seen and in, in the communities you work with. Uh, and, and if you could address or, or at least touch on some of the questions you've heard, if you've been uh, following along, I uh, would appreciate it. Um, but then we'll have uh, time for, for questions for you both too. So thank you for in advance for, for hanging in here tonight. Mr. Parker, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Bradeska and uh, good evening commissioners. And, and thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, yes, I've been listening since about halfway through Brian's uh, presentation. Uh, I'll do, I'm here representing the individual, the investigative model of civilian oversight in the state of California. The San Diego County Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board has been around since about 1990. Uh, there were some problems, obviously, within the community at that time, some in custody deaths, uh, a law enforcement involved shooting. So the the uh, elect the uh, the, um, the voters voted the fin. Uh, we went into effect in 1991. Our main jurisdiction is uh, we investigate. Uh, with a signed complaint, uh, complaints of or allegations of excessive force, false arrest, false reporting, illegal search and seizure, uh, any kind of misconduct, uh, whether it be procedural misconduct, uh, retaliation, discrimination, harassment, uh, any of those type of allegations. But we need a signed complaint to do so. Initially, our charter gave us the, the responsibility, and we think it's one of the obviously one of the most important responsibilities is to investigate any death that is the result of or arises out of the actions of sworn members of the sheriff's department and probation department. So we are again at the county level as an investigative model. So these are not just in custody deaths. These are not folks that just are in the custody of the sheriff's department who die in a jail. They're ones who perhaps were shot and killed by law enforcement or at the end of a pursuit where a, a citizen or you know somebody that's out on the road dies as, as a result of a traffic accident. Somebody dies in the back of a patrol car. We investigate those uh, situations without a signed complaint. And then finally, in response to the George Floyd uh, events of last year, or the incident involving George Floyd last year, our board of supervisors, who for the first time in probably CLRB's existence uh, over 30 years now, actually supports the review board. They actually expanded our authority to allow us to investigate without a signed complaint any use of force resulting in great bodily injury, 
any discharge of firearm, obviously not resulting in a death, and any use of force at any kind of protest event. So that's our jurisdiction. We have an 11-member panel, 11-member board. That board is appointed by the Board of Supervisors for the county. We do have six, uh, as, as part of, you know, for the longest time, we had two investigators. And our average, uh, average number of cases a year was 150. So we definitely did not have enough staff. We had not enough investigators to do the independent investigation. Our board of supervisors just granted us three additional uh, positions. So we went, actually we had three for about the last two years. Now we have six investigators and we're just getting them up and running and trained. We are advisory only. And I think it was Aaron who mentioned that uh, to, to be truly independent, we'd have to have some teeth. Well, we have the authority, but it is true, we're advisory. We make policy recommendations. We find that to be very important. Uh, we look at systemic issues within the department, if we can identify those through our case investigations, but our policy recommendations do not have to be accepted by the department. We also um, can uh, recommend discipline, but those disciplinary recommendations, again, are advisory only, and the department does not have to accept them. The big question of subpoena authority that I've heard a couple of times tonight, we have subpoena authority. And I have a ton of respect for Aaron, and I can't wait to see what Mike Janaka says about this, because maybe I'm wrong, too. I think we should have subpoena authority. I, I think that's a huge thing to have. Not, again, as a county-level person, we use our subpoenas to get ever, all the information about death cases, any death that occurs in, you know, at the Sheriff's Department or Probation Department. We subpoena them for the records. Uh, we get those records eventually when the case is closed on the, you know, on the part of the Sheriff or Probation Department. Sometimes that could be a year later. So our, you know, that's another story for another day. Uh, you know, my frustrations with some of the ways our hands are tied here. But as far as having subpoenas to get medical records, if we don't have sign, uh, a signed release from someone who died, obviously, well, we use our subpoenas to get the medical records from the hospital. We use subpoenas to get records from independent businesses who may have videotape or to get it from independent you know, uh, citizens who may have evidence. Uh, 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 or any records that we may need. We use our subpoenas for that. So I think it's important to have it. Uh, and I think it, it compelled the department, uh, the sheriff's department specifically, to ultimately cooperate with us. 25 years ago, uh, when CLERB was first coming into its own, the sheriff's department personnel, the sworn, sworn members of the department would come on and they wouldn't answer any questions. They would respond to our subpoena, but they wouldn't answer any questions whatsoever. They would plead the fifth. So it compelled their appearance, but not their cooperation. We used the subpoena authority to ultimately get their cooperation to come up with, a, with an agreement with the union that they will uh, respond to our written questions now. So at least for the last 25 years, we have some response and that was the subpoena authority that ultimately got us that, I think. So that's where I stand with that. Um, I don't wanna take a lot of Mike's time, but as far as the, the board members themselves, they are appointed again by the board of supervisors. They serve two, three-year terms if they're reappointed to the second term. With our turnover on our Board of Supervisors, uh, it used to be just like, oh, when you got to the end of your three-year term, the supervisor would just reappoint you. Well, now we have new supervisors, and they're wanting to bring their own people in. Um, as far as staff, I was appointed by the CLERB board, who, again, reports to and is appointed by the Board of Supervisors. I'm not elected or, or anything like that. I don't have any term limit. I serve at the leisure of the board. So six votes and I'm out. Uh, the staff members we have, the six investigators and the one administrative person, they report to me. Uh, they are county employees as am I. However, it's a, it's a weird, it's a fine line because we're independent. Um, I don't report to anybody in the county. Uh, so it's, very, it's a very strange dynamic, but, but the county does support us now more than ever as far as stakeholders. We had, we had not done community outreach or we had not solicited community involvement for years. The excuse was we didn't have the staff to do it. Well, that's all I've been doing now is reaching out to the community and listening to the community and, and kind of tailoring what we do based on the feedback we're getting from the community. Because again, it is about them. It's not about us. So I think again, not to, not to cut into Mike's time. So that's, that's the overview of an independent body right now. I can answer any questions about it after Mike speaks, but uh, that's, that's the basic overview. And so I'll just turn it over to Mike right now. All right, thank you. Mr. Jocko, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Hello, all. Uh, you had a lot of words thrown at you, and uh, so I'm batting last year, but I will hopefully will not uh, repeat what has already been said, but we'll just give you another perspective on the work that 
I have done in the 20 years that I have done oversight and been involved in uh, reforming police agencies and sheriff's departments throughout the state of California and beyond. Um, the older I get, the longer it takes to talk about my experience, so I'm going to let all that go. Uh, you can find me and my my resume on, on our website at oirgroup.com if you want. Um, but let me just jump in about some of the work that we've been doing currently. Um, for a long time, we were um, our team was the oversight, oversight group for the LA County Sheriff's Department, the largest sheriff's department in the country. Um, so we have experience uh, in overseeing sheriff's departments and I agree with both Aaron and Paul on the subpoena issue and I can try to explain that in a minute. Um, the um, work that I've done most recently has been, um, well, we've done a lot of things, but perhaps the one that's most relevant to tonight's discussion is the work we have been doing recently as independent police auditors for um, <clears throat> a number of um, cities in California. And by the way, um, I do have a connection with San Jose in the sense that as uh, Aaron has indicated, um, we are also uh, the monitors for the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office in your county. And um, we are also the independent police auditor for the city of Palo Alto. And we are currently taking a look at um, the way in which the San Jose Police Department responded to police protest activity last summer. And we'll be writing a public facing report uh, with regard to our observations, findings and recommendations uh, with regard to ways in which um, that response might be improved uh, on a forward going basis. So um, that report will be coming out uh, later this year um, and be interested to hear any of your reactions uh, after we deliver it to council and the mayor uh, later this year. <clears throat> So that, that is uh, my experience. Um, you know, perhaps um, one issue that um, might be further plumbed uh, and maybe interest, you all may be most interested in has to do with, as I said, our work as independent police auditors. And so we are, I'm, I'm sort of familiar with uh, the independent police auditor, how it's grown up in your city. I knew the very first independent police auditor and worked with her. Uh, uh, Teresa, who then became a judge, and I've seen the succession of auditors in your city uh, as we have moved forward in police oversight and gotten to know all of them quite well. Um, one distinction in the work that I do as independent police auditors for these other agencies is that about half of them, um, like the city of Davis, the city of Anaheim, and soon to be coming online, the city of Santa Monica, about half of them have a commission or a review board or some sort of public facing entity that we work with in combination, uh, in concert with them to provide um, oversight. About half of the agencies though, uh, in which we are independent police auditors, like the city of Palo Alto and the city of Santa Cruz, uh, do not have a formal review board or review body that we are able to work with uh, to, uh, to do our business of oversight. And I have to say that of the two entities, while we are able to, to do good things in both jurisdictions and all jurisdiction, I think um, I would come down on the side of appreciating uh, the cities that we work with that do have that review board, police accountability commission, whatever you call it, uh, entity that that gives us an opportunity to work with that group in a productive way. And I think that the two groups, the independent police auditor in conjunction with a public facing community review board of community members is uh, a good hybrid and a hybrid where the advantages of both can be brought to bear on the same on on similar issues of police reform. Um, so I'll talk about that in the remaining time that I have, as opposed to the entities that we work with that don't have that commissioner review board. So in the cities of Anaheim and Davis, and soon to be Santa Monica, 
there is a commission or a, a board that is uh, that meets regularly, uh, that hears from the community, uh, that we provide liaison to, um, and also get assignments from with regard to some of the work that we do. And, um, and then there's us who have uh, the work of getting into the weeds, uh, reviewing internal affairs investigations, reviewing uses of force, and coming up with um, a transparent report on our view of how the police agency is doing with regard to accountability, uh, how the uh, review board, how the police department is doing with regard to um, um, reviewing uses of force, and how the police department is doing with regard to um, learning from deadly force incidents, force incidents to make uh, the department better and to make their officers better prepared to deal with future uh, circumstances. Where the commission or the review boards come into play is one, they provide a support. Uh, two, they are the voice and they are members of the community, of which we are not. And three, provide us a sounding board uh, with which to um, uh, advise on how we're, how we're, what we're learning and what we're finding in a very productive and complementary way. The other thing that the uh, review board of the police commission can do that is largely outside our wheelhouse is they can examine aspects of policing that do not come within our day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day work as police auditors. So what I mean by that is since, the, since most of our work is geared toward looking at uh, investigations of misconduct to make sure that they are thorough and objective and if not to report out that they're not uh, and doing the same with regard to force, we are looking at the agencies through a very small window. But there are a lot of other things that police departments are responsible to do that we don't generally look at. And that's in our view where a police commission or a police review board can have an important role to play in looking at some of those other systems. So whether that is uh, examining the way in which their police agency recruits potential officers or hire who they're recruiting to, or whether it's uh, taking a look at the hiring process and the criteria that is making the decision about who to hire for a policing job, or whether it's looking at the way in which a police department evaluates the work of police department officers, um, or whether it's the way in which a police department decides who it is that's worthy of promotion, who's going to get the lieutenant's job who is gonna get the captain or sergeant's job and playing a role in developing criteria to um, provide a community facing perspective on all those important decisions that are kind of outside our wheelhouse, but are really important in the way in which a police department's makeup, its culture and its work is being done by the, um, and, and for the commissioner review board to play a role there in my view is, is quite important role for, for them to have. And again, it's outside our wheelhouse. We can help, we can assist, we can provide information on best practices, but it's consistent with you know, President Obama's 21st century policing um, uh, rubric, which is to get the community more involved in uh, improving and assisting and making, uh, having input and engagement with how some of these very important systemic decisions are being made. And we think that's the role that um, commissions or review boards that we work with are most effective, most important, and have a significant role to play. And uh, for the cities that we work with that don't have that commission component, there isn't a group that is con con constituted to do that work. Um, and so sometimes we get a project uh, to do that work as auditors, but we don't have that community facing component to do it regularly. So I think that that is an area uh, where cities that don't have a commission or a review board, 
like your city might benefit from constituting a review board to look at some of these broader issues. Um, and and um, I understand that IPA is doing some of that work on the side, but it's not their bread and butter, right? So that would be um, where I would come down on, on one of the things that per perhaps you are looking at to improve the way in which there is a more holistic response to some of these challenges and issues in policing today. Uh, with regard to a couple other issues that have been raised, I'll just I'll just talk about my experience with regard to some of them. Uh, I gave a very lawyer answer with regard to, I agree with both Paul and Aaron who have different views on subpoenas, but I'll explain that since I am, I went to law school and I consider myself a reformed attorney. Um, but what I will say is that I think that Aaron is correct that in a city, there shouldn't be a need for any entity who is involved in police report and police reform to need subpoenas to get information. So what I mean by that is that the police chief works for the city manager, the city manager works for city council, and therefore, um, if council and the manager, city manager, are in fact uh, interested and committed to police reform and oversight, there should not be an issue with regard to a failure of the police department and its leadership to cooperate with providing information. That just shouldn't be a problem at all. I think it's a different situation when you live in Paul Parker's world of sheriffing. And I can tell you that based on my most recent experience in your county, uh, with the sheriff of Santa Clara County, where up to now, because she is a constitutionally elected independent official, we have been challenged in accessing information that ordinarily we've never had a problem with, with regard to our oversight of police departments. And that is because in a county system in California, uh, the Board of Supervisors or no other entity has authority to tell the sheriff what to do. Um, and therefore, I think in that situation in which you are trying to oversee a county uh, agency that is overseen by an independently elected constitutional officer, that the authority to have subpoenas is probably a good idea. You all are not engaged with the county. Uh, and um, so I, I'm not sure that it is as essential as it is if you were the Charter Reform Commission for Santa Clara County. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is the selection process because in some ways I think that is the most challenging task. Uh, whenever a community-based review board or commission is formed, the traditional approach has been for the elected officials to choose a selectees who have applied to be considered for the position. Uh, that's the traditional approach. Um, there have been, has been criticism uh, with regard to that approach because of a view that that potentially politicizes the whole process in the sense that those selected uh, are selected by political uh, representatives of uh, a jurisdiction and therefore politics will enter into it. The elected official will most likely choose somebody who is aligned with his or her political position on police reform and other issues. And I do think that that uh, criticism has some validity um, as a result of that, as, as I think Aaron has indicated, and, and Brian also might have mentioned it in his opening remarks, and now that I remember, I think he did, is there has been some moves to try and come up with a system whereby uh, commissioners would run for office. And I think Berkeley thought about it when they were reconstituting their commission, but they discarded it. And I think 
they did uh, for the reasons that be careful about what you wish for. And that is a concern that if um, commission or review board members run for office, um, those who are most interested in police reform are often associations representing police officers who may not be as interested in police reform and may want to put their resources and their activism and their energy and money behind um, uh, individuals who be, may be more sympathetic to police officers. So I think that is the concern about the elected approach. Um, we went through this process in Anaheim and we couldn't figure out as we were trying to design the review board uh, what approach might work the best. And we recognize the disadvantages of some of the approaches that I've already talked about. So what did they do in Anaheim? What they did in Anaheim is they, they um, solicited applicants who were interested in a review board position from each of their districts. And um, they went through some vetting to make sure that uh, the applicants met minimal qualifications. For example, they lived in the city of Anaheim. Uh, but then at the end of the process, all those who were qualified went literally, their names literally went into a hat and they were pulled out randomly. And, um, and it was a random drawing of individuals who were interested in the position, took all of the politics out of it entirely. And uh, I have to say, although I went forward with some trepidation on this process, we ended up with a pretty good group. Uh, of a very diverse um, group of individuals who've been very uh, committed to their responsibilities as review board members. So that's just another way of cutting a cake that is uh, very difficult to really come up with the perfect solution. Um, I am always interested in coming in under time and under budget, and you've had a lot of discussion today. So I'm gonna end my opening remarks here. Um, uh, but certainly open to any questions that any of you might have as the evening wears, uh, draws to a close. And I, I also say thank you all for your commitment and interest in, in this very important topic for your city. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Janako and Mr. Parker. We'll open it up to questions from commissioners. I see Commissioner Gilman, you still have your hand raised. Do you have a, a question to start us off? Oh, okay, Commissioner Siegel. Okay, not so much a question. I just wanted to make sure that the commissioners were aware that um, Mr. Parker of San Diego, his model does not have an IPA. It's it's just a a, a panel, a, a commission, a board. So it's it's actually the opposite of us. We have just an IPA. So I, I wanted everyone to know that we we have a full panel here. Um, and also Mr. Uh, Gineco is representing models that have both an IPA and also um, a board. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Well, with that kind of uh, queuing up, I can't resist adding a question to the one that I had. Um, Cause thank you, thank you for, for pointing that out. Commissioner Siegel, that's, that's a really important um, uh, way of looking at this. And thank you both um, for speaking to us and, and sharing insight late on a Monday. So I guess then I'm curious for uh, insights on, you know, we've, we've heard a strong case um, from Mr. Zisser for the importance that an IPA be complemented by a board. I'm curious um, to Mr. Parker, if you see the reverse being true, and also Mr. Chinaco's insights on that. Um, <clears throat> the other piece, uh, as, as I had raised earlier, um, we are a charter review commission. There are elements of policy that can be codified into the charter to, to you know, make them harder to change by the city council. Um, there are elements of policy that are better not to codify into the charter. And so uh, if you need to have that kind of nimbleness, whatever it might be. Um, and so I'm curious in the experience of either of you, whether you've, whether you've either um, found language in the charter that was particularly helpful 
um, particularly a barrier uh, or, or a lack of language in the charter um, that you found to be helpful or a barrier versus language that, that was codified elsewhere. I will turn over the first part of your question, Commissioner, to Mr. Janako in reference to the, the commissioner and the I, you know, commission and an IPA if he thinks that that's important to, to have both or, or that was, I think, the lead of your question. And uh, I, I would support having both. I think the combination of having um, somebody who has the ability to get into the weeds and look at cases and review investigations and conduct um, audits and take a look at force incidents and do some transparent reporting. I think that's all important and critical, but I also do think that a commission component uh, of civilians who are interested in contributing to issues of police reform is also important to have. And by the way, this um, Anaheim Police Review Board actually writes an annual report with their own recommendations apart from the work that we do. So I think that um, it resonates differently. They have a different perspective than we do, um, but we ally ourselves. And I think the combination of having two groups um, is quite symbiotic. And then in reference to your second question, um, I think, uh, as far as the charter goes, our charter, I think, is, is pretty good. It, it codifies our authority pretty well, although, um, interestingly enough, I don't think it, it goes far enough. I, I think, you know, there are some, you know, we only have jurisdiction over the sworn personnel of our department. So if you have medical staff or professional staff or non-sworn members of the department in which there may be some systemic issues or whatnot, we really can't opine on that because we don't have the authority to, to look into those things. So. I think uh, to have the ability to have the charter amended uh, as you progress and evolve. Um, I also think that maybe some of the wording in the charters would be good, you know, uh, not to not to totally nail you down or you know box you in, but maybe have some more open-ended uh, verbiage, perhaps pursuant to current case law or you know something like that that would allow you to to have some flexibility um, uh, to to expand your your horizon, so to speak, and just be able to think more outside of the box, if that makes any sense at all, Commissioner. What? Thank you both. Uh, other questions from commissioners for our esteemed guests? Are we questioned out? I'll give it another minute or two here. Hmm. The public might have questions, possibly. We will turn it over to public comment in a moment. Um, but before we um, thank our guests, um, maybe we'll just uh, ask if Mr. Parker, if Mr. Janako, if you have any additional insights to share before we wrap up, you have, <laughs> you have some extra time. Well, um, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll go first. One of my concerns with, with uh, civilian oversight in general, and I, and I hope that you folks are able to maybe somehow do this maybe better than, than we have done. Um, you know, we were created 30 years ago with the purpose of being independent and to provide a transparent model, right? But because of some of the case law that's been in place in California for some time now, we're not transparent. We're not as transparent as we could be. You know, we can't discuss our cases in open session. They have to go closed session. We can't, we can't identify deputies. It has to be deputy one or deputy two when it comes to the public. So these are things that I'm hoping that- I, again, to his point about the privacy laws of California being very restrictive on what oversight can do, I totally agree with that and more uh, needs to be done with regard to um, providing more transparency and the ability of oversight review boards, commissions, IPAs to be able to report more about what's going on with rega regard to uh, very important um, issues of accountability, discipline, uh, and, and how a department is holding its officers accountable. Florida doesn't have any of those privacy laws and their policing seems to be just fine. So 
uh, there is another parallel universe that seems to be getting along just fine. And, and where I'm going with this is that I think that commissions and review boards, if they're interested, can play a role on these larger issues. By that I mean, if a commission and review board recognizes how uh, current state law hamstrings uh, the ability to be transparent with its community, either the review board or commission itself or its IPA is restricted by transparency laws. Well, that's something that a commission on my view can get behind and can go to council and make a recommendation that the elected leadership of the city um, work hard on behalf of advocates who are trying to change that law. IPAs don't really have the ability to do that because they're supposed to be apolitical, but I think commissions and boards do have that ability. And I have seen very effectively uh, cases or times in which the review board has been able to do that. So that's just another example of why in my view, ideally, a public facing commission or board that has that ability to do more than an IPA can be very helpful with regard to police reform. Great, thank you both. Well, um, I think with that, if there's no questions, we will uh, thank you again, uh, both of you for, for joining us tonight. Uh, at this this later hour and appreciate your your knowledge and, and sharing it with with this commission uh, as they think about uh, recommendations for the city of San Jose. Thank you, Commissioner. And just, uh, you know, sometimes people tomorrow morning might have a question or two that they want to further explore. And I'll make myself available uh, for that if there are any further questions as you all move forward in this process. And I, I will as well, obviously, uh, whatever I can do, I, I will certainly do to help you folks as you move forward. Much appreciated to you both. I will pass it back to the vice chair. Thank you. And thank you for all our speakers who came today. That was very informative and a thought provoking discussion. Um, we'll now turn it to public comment. So if I can have the clerk help me with that. That's the wood, Nancy. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tessa Woodman. See, well, I just wanted to appreciate um, Aaron Zisser. I think that's his name. Yeah, and I looked him up in regards to um, uh, Blair. Blair um, had told me, you know, the history and you know just a sad phenomenon how that that went down. That he got laid off. He got, I guess, bought out. You know, his whatever. But you know, it just shows. And then the problems with the independent police officers or whatever it was that, you know, was having trouble with him. And I think it shows the problems with, um, you know, just these independent police, uh, you know, people, you know, or you know, that look over the police that it shouldn't be the police who can, you know, knock them off of their stage, essentially. And so, you know, that's where I was happy to hear about the more people in the uh, community involved in some oversight board. I think that's important so that the police don't have power to um, undermine their regulatory. It's a regulatory capture, essentially. And um, so that was that. And the other thing I appreciated what um, Mr. Zisser was saying was also about the horrific things that happened during the uh, protests. And that, yes, you know, people that got shot in the groin and, and, and even Jake Tonkel was almost missed, you know, when he was there, you know, it's, that was horrific. And so, and to just see the corruption that I see goes on where, you know, the mayor or, and his Republican oriented, um, you know, compatriots, um, Republican valued compatriots, you know, protecting, um, you know, not allowing the discussion and, and, you know, hiding it and things like that. So, you know, and, and just, you know, suppressing uh, dialogue. And so that, you know, anyway, I guess, you know, just, I just appreciated that he said that we really needed so much more um, oversight. And so I'm really supportive of that we get away from policing and caring, community caring is very critical. Caller 5140. Yeah, I don't know if any of this is ever going to help anything because it's impossible 
with all their unions and the district attorney's office, everything else, which is actually hurting. District attorney's office isn't helping anybody. But they talk about the abuse of uh, people in the post-George Floyd event. And it was really the chickens coming home to roost because in 2016, there were a number of Trump supporters that were beat down while San Jose PD just looked on, just like the sheriffs in the South looked on as Klansmen brutal, brutalized African Americans. It was like a really strange thing. You know, there was a guy who was Hispanic and gay who got beat up by these by these counter uh, protesters. And 250 San Jose police officers stood back and did absolutely nothing. And for me, watching San Jose PD kind of get beat down a few years later was like the chickens coming home to roost. So it just goes to show you, and nothing happened to San Jose PD, nothing. Uh, nothing happened to Mayor Licardo. Actually, him and Eddie had to give some phony apology to some of the people who were injured quite bad. And I actually had a discussion with Eddie Garcia face-to-face, and he just told me that it was just too bad what happened that day, that uh, they just weren't trained properly. And then what was it, four years later, all of a sudden, those same people who attacked the Trump supporters attacked the police. And uh, those supporters, uh, all of a sudden... Paul Soto? Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Zisser. I was uh, I was locked up when that uh, fiasco happened with you and, and Paul Kelly, and how much pleasure he had on his face when he walked into your office and put that file on the desk, and 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 the, 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 how cavalier and 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 like uh, almost like a smug look on his face when he did it because they filmed it. And so as, as a Sajonero, as a sixth generation Sajonero Chicano, I, I, I know exactly what happened with you. And that's part of the problem. All the work that we're doing right here, I've been on every, every single reimagining meeting, every single one of them start to finish, I've been on every single one. I'm not gonna walk out of the room. I am not gonna walk out of the room. The work is too critically important. The Chicano community has their own George Floyd and his name is Danny Trevino. Danny Trevino was a black beret in the 1970s this man was murdered inside of his vehicle, sitting there next to his old lady because of his activities with the Black Braves. And all they were doing was protecting the community with an organization called CAP, Community Against Policing. Now, this Chicano history, I have documents of all this. All the documents and all the posters from the Danny Trevino uh, protests, I have them. And on them was articulated the history. So this, the Chicano history must be centered within the context of these conversations. Number two is that um, uh, Plata versus Brown, when I was looking at your uh, bio, I'm not sure if you worked on Plata versus Brown, uh, Mr. Zisser, but if you did, thank you. I, the school to prison pipeline, the first time that I went to juvenile hall was a result of being picked up by a police officer because of a program called TABS. Back then, in the 1980s, they were picking up kids off the street between eight and two and taking you to juvenile hall. That's how I got into into the system. Jessalyn Faust. Yeah. Um, first, I would like to say that I'm really disappointed in the attitude of some of the people on the commission, um, specifically uh tobin gilman it's obvious that you don't care about this that you aren't interested in this and for the public to be able to see you sitting there rolling your eyes laughing at something clearly not be paying any type of attention you should be embarrassed you should absolutely be embarrassed of yourself i don't know why you are on this charter review commission i don't know who put you there, but don't worry, we're going to find out who put you there and see if there's any way we can get you removed because you should absolutely not be part of this commission. Your behavior is disgusting and you should be embarrassed of yourself. 
I was really glad to hear um, that the commission is thinking about this, is taking this under discussion. Um, I really uh, am concerned about if uh, the people on this commission are, are qualified to do this. And I would really ask you to remember that uh, you were appointed through whatever process um, to represent the community, that you're not there to represent your own interests, that you're there to represent our community. And our community is not okay with the actions of San Jose police, San Jose police who have already killed uh, an unarmed man this year. Um, and, you know, I, I was there at the protest. I have been shot at by San Jose police and I've watched San Jose police uh, fire rubber bullets into crowds full of children. So I really hope this charter commission can Blair Beekman. All right, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. I guess uh, to start off, um, you know, thank you for all the speakers. Um, and I guess to start off, uh, it was very nicely mentioned, uh, a question was asked, uh, is there a way to continue the reimagine uh, task force committee that's restarted again uh, past six months? Can we can we let it go indefinitely or, or maybe a year perhaps um, at, at the uh, at a community uh, meeting today co a committee meeting uh, there's a, there's going to be an upcoming uh, community economic uh, task force committee that's uh, it's going to invite basically the whole community uh, it's probably based on ideas from this group and it's going to you know it's invite schools, it's going to invite businesses, and what are we going to do about our economic future in this era of COVID uh, within San Jose? It's going to be a really interesting process, and I think to have the uh, reimagined task force around that, uh, it should be something interesting. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Aaron Zisser and the first speaker. The first speaker spoke about ideas of, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going from warrior police to guardian police, to just being a, a part of the public process. That is, that is the step I think we're all considering and hoping right now. I think we're moving, reimagine past the ideas of no, we cannot do that, to well, it is practical and kind of nice and it's good ideals. Let's really move forward into that now. We're starting to do it, let's do that. And, and uh, I wanted to thank just Aaron Zisser overall. It's just really nice to hear him. And uh, I think we're all feeling bad what we were doing at that time. And it's nice to hear that we have invited him back to the process. Um, boy, I hope I can speak more on these things. Uh, I, I have more to say. Thanks for all the, for the work here. Thank you. Police accountability now. Yes, uh, thank you. So I just want to thank uh, Mr. Aaron uh, for pushing back on the remarks of Commissioner uh, Tobin uh, and indicating that the police, in fact, did not get enough bad press for their response to the George Floyd protests. Uh, as a member of the activist community who was deeply involved in those protests, I experienced firsthand um, the response, the brutal response uh, initially by uh, San Jose police. And I 100% uh, agree and support that statement. Um, <clears throat> more importantly, I wanted to point out uh, in regards to those George Floyd protests, when we finally do get a drop in the ink link of accountability, of um, transparency, it gets accompanied by a bunch of copaganda, uh, which is not helpful. I don't need uh, cops explaining to try to uh, tell me exactly what I'm witnessing with a video. Transparency is supposed to come with a, a degree of uh, objectivity. All I need is the videos, and I can make my own decisions about what I'm seeing in those videos. I do not need top explain, uh, to be cops explained by it. Thank you. Back to the commission. Thank you. Now we will go to new business. Um, the discussion of bylaws have been deferred to our meeting for September 20th. So, um, and the discussion for the governance structure subcommittee recommendation has also been deferred to September 20th. So now we will move to our subcommittee report item. 
Um, and this is the time for subcommittees to ask questions of other subcommittees. Do any commissioners have questions for subcommittees outside of their own? Please raise your hand. Vice Chair, I just wanna make sure that we pick up um, where we left off in the last conversation. Um, so I think it might, before we go on to subcommittee reports that are new business, I think we might just ask other commissioners to share um, responses to Commissioner Matsumura's question about um, timing of recommendation delivery, if I could paraphrase <laughs> uh, in that way. Is that, yes. is that amenable to you? Yes, thank you, Lawrence. I actually was going to bring that up right after. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we yeah. just can, I think we should go right back, drop, drop right back into that so that we can just um, finish out public comment on that and then, and then go into new business. Sounds good. Uh, hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, just to refresh folks' uh, memory, um, we were uh, talking about the possibility of delivering um, recommendations, especially around the um, uh, timing of, of mayoral election uh, earlier, since it was uh, uh, seems to be well, it, it's a it's a uh, pressing issue with, with some specific timing. Also, uh, seemed to be uh, of um, uh, some immediate interest for, for uh, council members, but um, wondering if the uh, other commissioners have thoughts about that. And, and ultimately, I think it, it's something that we can consider, take, uh, think about some options and bring it back for you all to, to, to think about as far as how to, how to move forward. But would really love to hear thoughts from, from you all about um, uh, to, to, to take into consideration. So I see Commissioners Fuentes, uh, Marshman, and Percival. Commissioner Fuentes. Okay, so I just want to comment that um, we've said at several meetings that we would like to um, to look at our schedule and our timeline to give us more time to make sure that we we do all our work and we we do it correctly. And I think especially tonight, you know, after hearing um, so much really good information, and we we have a group that's working on this um, and including the comment that was made about um, trying to to work alongside or collaborate well you know at least to be able to um, to figure out how we can work with the um, reimagining uh, task force so there's quite a few reasons I mean, a number of reasons as to why we should look at our schedule try and get what really needs to go to the city council and the mayor done in a timely way, but then extend our timeline so we make sure we do everything right because um, I really don't think we should be rushing um, the work that we're doing. It's really important and it's supposed to be long lasting. So I hope I was clear. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Marshman. You're muted still. There you are. All right, there I am. Um, I apologize for having missed a couple of meetings. It's been a wild summer. Um, I, um, as some may remember, I actually suggested trying to do this um, particular issue early because there seemed to be such a consensus on it. And I was told probably rightly at the time that it was way too early, but, but I do think it, this is this is fairly clear, and uh, the only the only reservation is I don't know what debate there is about how to do the um, uh, the election. I, I can't recall at this point if if that's a clear recommendation uh, whether a mayor should be elected for six years or for two years uh, to to do the makeup. I think it would be a great idea to be able to get that to the council and try to get them started on it first. Um, and it will take, I think, some weight off, off uh, some of the other uh, debates that may be more difficult for us. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Percival. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, just a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I, I, I think, um, at least I've, as I've thought about this, that the mayoral election issue, while it can stand by itself, um, also, you know, the members of the community may want to um, 
think about the uh, that proposal in the context of any future discussions we're having on the strong mayor. Um, in the sense that if there this if there was a proposal, I don't know if there is going to be, so I'm not making any statements on that. Um, but that if there was a strong mayor proposal, then uh, certainly many could argue that it becomes even more important to have uh, a you know the timing move to a uh, a year, the presidential years when we have the most robust uh, turnout. Um, but I guess I would like to hear a little bit more, and maybe we don't know the answers to that tonight about you know how this would move forward in terms of debate because I do think it's uh, we have. Um, a lot of great work being done um, on the subcommittees on, on policing. And I think it's really important that that moves forward on the timeline that we have uh, that we have we have agreed upon now, uh, and that's important work. So um, the city council has debated the timing of the mayoral election before a couple of different times, so it's not like a brand new issue. So I think even if this did move forward, say in late September or in October or even later that the council would be able to put it, uh, I think, and debate it fairly quickly in time and, and city attorney can tell us about again about the timing, what would be necessary to get this on the on the ballot in time for, for the next year's election. So those are just some of my thoughts. So. Great, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, exactly what I'd like to hear. Uh, Commissioner Dieppe, I see your hand as well. Yeah, so on, on this, you know, I. A few things. As, as a matter of writing the report, I, I think it's important to write one report, not different parts of a report. Um, so I think, it, it, and for the question of sending to the council early, I think that's doable. Um, as a commission, do we, we vote provisionally overwhelmingly to support it? Uh, does that provisional decision change at all if with anything else that we're talking about, with police reform or with uh, strong or, or not strong mayor or anything else? If, if there's a conditional tie to it that somehow if we do something that might change how some of us feels about it, then maybe not. But if, if that's an independent, like it stands that we all agree that let's go ahead and make the move, um, I, I see no problem moving that early to the uh, to the council, I, just through a letter, just through just a communique saying that this is the, the, the conclusion or their recommendation of the commission, you know, do with it what you will to, so you have more time to work on it. We don't, I don't think that we necessarily have to speed up writing that part of the report in terms of like, you know, uh, supporting documents or, or citations or, or uh, addendums or whatever else. I think we need to take the, our time with that. Um, it, it, Commissioner Percival is correct that the council's debated that. And, and, you know, I will speak for the current council members, but I, if you count the votes, I think it's there to support this recommendation. Um, the timing, and, and uh, Mark, if I'm wrong, just convince, uh, correct me, but I think what the council needs time on is to send direction to the city attorney's office to draft ballot language. And, and that's, I think that's the important timeline they need. That's correct. And then uh, every ballot measure has to be sent to the board of supervisors or the registrar of voters 88 days before the date of the election. I believe for the June primary, it's March 3rd, uh, but don't hold me to that. Sometime in the first week of March is when the resolution and the election would need to be called. Yeah, so whatever, we can send it early, but we don't need to do it like this week, next week. We have up to, until what, however many days to give 88 days ahead of whatever that is, and maybe a few weeks ahead of time for the council to go through its process. So those are my thoughts. Great, thank you. Other thoughts on this topic? Uh, Commissioner Personal, Percival, please. Yeah, sorry, I just one other quick thought. Um, one, one other thing that might be, um, you know, give us, some additional reasons to, you know, to obviously get everything else that we need done, uh, but to to move this forward perhaps earlier. Would you get, we already have candidates who are have pledged to to run for office. So um, knowing what you know what the what the language is going to look like uh, may affect the kind of campaign they run, may affect the what voters how they judge the candidates for. So out of fairness to the to the candidates, it may be uh, of interest to. Uh, to try to move this uh, forward in a, in a timely manner, whatever that looks like. So. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Matsumura, then Commissioner Callender. Uh, since I spoke on this earlier, I'd love to hear from Commissioner Callender before speaking again. Okay, Commissioner Callender. And, and I apologize, I had a um, Valley Water Board meeting, <laughs> so I wasn't able to join folks. And I just wanna make sure I'm hearing clearly. 
is the discussion on do we move certain pieces forward like the strong mayor and the um and the timing of the mayoral election and we just move that along quicker yeah there was um some uh, public comment earlier um uh, following up on commissioner meitsky's suggestion uh at the last commission meeting that there could be an opportunity to i won't say fast track but but move along this uh particular recommendation or set of recommendations um, to the council sooner since there is uh, pretty overwhelming, you know, at least provisionally support for this uh, and that it was of a particular interest to, and, and a timely interest by yeah. council. Well, well I, I can uh, speak from where I am. I, I'd love to move those things along. I'm, I'm sure what you heard tonight is a lot of the things that we've heard in the subcommittee. I've heard a lot of the testimony. I had the opportunities to really um, noodle in on the um, you know, reimagining a policing issue. Um, we've had months and months and months of discussions and presentations on the two issues, I think, that you said that Mr. Maitsky spoke to. I, I, I'd hope that we could, you know, deliberate and move these things along quicker so we can put our time and attention to what's remaining. And if somehow, if it links back in and we need to revisit it, we could, we could always revisit it. But I would hope that we can um, move the other pieces along quickly and put our attention to what's remaining. That's where I sit. Great, thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Calendar, can I ask something really quickly? Do I hear a motion to add this to consent calendar? Um, to add, I, I apologize, Vice Chair, could you um, repeat that to add what to the consent calendar? To add this, to add this discussion or to add something to move this, the topic I want to along. defer to uh, Commissioner Matsumura who has her hand up behind me, uh, knowing that if she makes a motion, uh, to go in this direction, I will be very supportive. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Matsumura? Yeah, thank you both and to, to everybody um, for the comments on, on how we might do this. It, it, it does sound like there's enough interest in this approach that um, uh, I think it would be valuable if uh, perhaps it would be uh, others should should modify this if appropriate. Um, if the subcommittee on elections um, could perhaps work with Lawrence, and I, I don't know whether support would be needed from the city attorney about the exact path for this to to move forward. Um, but with a, a recommendation to, to to bring back a recommendation to the commission's next meeting about how we would do this should we choose to to go forward with trying to um, bring this this item to the council to the council earlier um yeah, but i do see that commissioner Matesky has raised his hand and as as somebody who brought up this idea at the last meeting it seems important to hear from him uh, yeah thank you i'm i'm generally supportive i i, I raised as you mentioned i raised this before my only concern is could this potentially um could we uh i'm trying to think of the word uh could uh would they would the consent the council kind of get mad at us for even asking the question and is there some way we may want to test the waters informally versus some sort of formal thing first so maybe we can do the same maybe we can do both during the next two weeks i don't know if something if the chair could kind of you know kind of talk to the mayor, test the waters with some of the council members and see how they would react to this. That, that's my only concern. And I see Commissioner Fuentes, and then um, maybe I, I would just also ask the city clerk to, to share any thoughts she has about feasibility on this. Commissioner Fuentes? Um, I was just, let's see. Um, I, am, um, I am thinking that <clears throat> what we should try to do is, um, get the commission directives done, um, not get it done sooner than they're due, but just focus on making sure we get those done on time and then make sure that we give ourselves more time or ask for more time for those the, the other additional items that we have come up with. Because I, I think as long as we make the original deadline of, the, of our directives, I think we're doing well. And there's no purpose in trying to rush those because um, we want to make sure we give all of that work enough time and there's no reason to 
to try and get it done sooner than is expected. So um, that's what I would hope to see in a motion that we actually fulfill the deadline of the three directives. And then at the same time, um, and so we could do a different motion or however we want to do it. But then, and I think we're, we had said earlier that we were not going to take any action today because we do want to, to give time for, um, for our chair to be able to engage in this whole thing, discussion. But again, I, I'm just saying that we should be able to meet our deadline for the directives, but we need more time to do everything else that we're, we're putting on our plate that's also important. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. Um, the timeline that we, we shared with you before the six o'clock hour and that's attached to the agenda um, is does take that into consideration, exactly what you're, you're talking about, Maria. Um, it's not rushing a timeline. It's here's a schedule. It, if we meet, add extra meetings, meet a lot, and do, you know, have all these study sessions, we can still get all of those things done by like a final deadline that gives the council enough time to also public have public hearings and to discuss. So we don't want to push it past December because you can say, oh, well, you have until March to, to get it to the ROV. <clears throat> the council needs, they're going to, more people are going to talk during the, the, the council session. So that's what this timeline is designed to do. It's get your, the main topics done on time, but also to allow for the other topics to be discussed so we could possibly get them all done around the same time. Thank you. And I saw Commissioner Marshman's hand, uh, and then I'm gonna pass it back to you, Vice Chair, because there's a motion on the floor. Commissioner Marshman. Oh, um, uh, yeah, I um, I think getting getting this ready to go is maybe what would be more important to me to sort of get it off, you know, get it down, get get the uh, uh, get one thing solid for us, and we can hold it and turn it all in at the same time. It just occurred to me that it might be better for the council to uh, to be able to tackle an issue like this ahead of time. I think it. I don't think it's going to be controversial in the council either. I think the mayor even supports it now. So, um, but that's that's fine. Just kind of get it get it out of the way. That's all I'm I'm saying. Whether we turn it in or not. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, is anyone going to make a motion about this? I think we may have had a motion for Commissioner Matsumura. And I was a second if that was a motion. I was trying to, <laughs> <laughs> I to clarify. I wasn't sure. Thank you. I will I will clarify uh, that that was a motion and uh, essentially to to bring back what it what it would look like if we actually do want to move this um, in the form of a letter as Commissioner Yep had said to council um, on an earlier timeline. That's a second. Okay, great. Can I have the clerk take roll, please? Yes, uh, Barbara Marshman. Yes. So, uh, sorry, point of order, uh, just to clarify the motion, because uh, I believe I heard this before in Commissioner Massimo's comments. Is this being referred back to the voting and elections subcommittee to, to finalize, or uh, is this just a general motion to say that we need to finalize the idea and then we can send it off. It, in order to to decide whether we want to do this, I think we need to understand what that process would actually entail. Um, and so it's a it's a request to receive that information at the next meeting, uh, a motion to to um, to have that information provided at the next meeting. Um, and I was naming off the election subcommittee, um, Lawrence and the city attorney as the people who I thought would probably need to be involved in order to prepare that information. Does that clarify? Um, uh, yes, because it sounds like we're involved, but uh, I guess then just a question for Lawrence here or, or Mark too before we continue voting. Um, so if this uh, motion passes, is the does the my, does our subcommittee meet 
to uh, finalize the language and, and then, I guess, propose or present um, a letter draft or I, the next steps? Yeah, I, I don't think so. What I'm hearing in the motion is just a request for information about how these recommendations could be moved move forward to council given the directive of this commission and how reports are submitted and, and other you know, legal uh, considerations for um, what this council is set out to do. Uh, and then to bring that back to, to the commission um, uh, to, and, and perhaps we could talk about sort of what your, what your subcommittee might like to do based on what's been heard. But I do think that the, what I'm hearing is that the commission would then discuss that the, how to move forward based on that information request. Okay, I, I just want to clarify what, uh, if we need to call our subcommittee back to meet again, because I think everyone's kind of been enjoying a little bit of time off. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. I, undoubtedly, you, there will be a little more work to do here, I think, if we're going to move this forward. But I see Mark is unmiked, so I might. Thank and, you. And Madam Vice Chair, uh, just a point of order, because again, I came in a little bit later. Have we heard from the public on this motion? Or have we heard from the public on this? We have not um, heard yet no we we took oh, we we? comment we took public comment on this item before six o'clock okay oh, okay thank you all right can we continue with roll please uh i'll begin again barbara marshman yes christina johnson yes elizabeth mongley yes <clears throat> ellie matsumura Enrico Callender? Aye. Frank Kaminsky? Yes. Garrick Percival? Yes. <clears throat> George Sanchez? Yes. Hui Tran? Yes. Jeremy Barus? Yes. Jose Posadas? Yes. Juan Diep? Aye. Linda Lizotte? Luis Brosio? Yes. Magnolia Siegel. Sorry, I didn't catch your vote there. Magnolia Siegel. Yes. Thank you. Maria Fuentes. Yes. Sammy Robledo. Yes. Sherry Segura. Yes. T. Tran. Aye. Tobin Gilman. Yes. Veronica Amador. Yes. Yong Zhao? Yes. That motion passes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I believe that we're now at public comment, open forum. Megan or Tony, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you want to go to subcommittee reports? Yeah, now we need to go to new business. Yes. Can we? Okay, we will go to um, subcommittee report. So I guess is members of the public would like to address this item. Please raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> Vice Chair, we, we had uh, um, in our notes had um, the asking commissioners, um, uh, representatives from subcommittees if they had any questions of other subcommittees and then going to the public. Apologies. No problem. That was a long meeting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. I, I, in the interest of time, you can also defer this item if you wanted to. Let's just power through. Um, <laughs> any commissioners um, would like, if you have any questions uh, about other subcommittees and what they're researching on, now is the time to ask. Please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see anyone. Uh, Commissioner Siegel has oh, her hand sorry. up. Sorry, sorry, commi Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. My question is for Commissioner Percival. Um, there is an ambiguity on the in the term incumbent mayor, and uh, when city attorney and I have had to look up what what was meant by that, we had to do what's called legislative a form of legislative history, which is to go back to what you had said and what your intent was. And when we're writing uh, laws, we don't, we want to make sure they're super clear so that um, people don't have to go back and look at our intent through um, documents or videos or anything um, 
outside of the actual language that's being proposed. So do you, would you be amenable to defining the term incumbent mayor to either include or exclude the current mayor, Sam Licardo? Yeah, thanks, uh, Commissioner Siegel. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, and I, I did try to uh, clarify it, I think, in our in our last presentation, and, and it's it, I'm sure it wasn't good enough. Um, so it gets a little tricky because when we talk about an incumbent, of course, we're, we're talking about the, the person who's currently in office. Um, but in 2024, um, uh, well, let, let me back up. So we'll have a we'll have a mayoral election in 2022, right? Uh, Mayor Licardo at that point will be termed out of office and he will not be able to run again under current policy. The proposal that we put forward would not allow Mayor Licardo to run again, right? He's, he's served two, two four-year terms. So the incumbent in reference uh, in the 2024 election would be the person who is elected in 2022, beginning to serve in 2023 and would serve a two-year term that person, whoever that is, would be the incumbent mayor, they would be able then to run for a new full four-year term in 2024. That would run until 2028. They would then be able to run for re-election again uh, to serve a second four full-year term. If they're successful in getting, in getting re-elected, um, they would then serve, you know, an additional four years. So for the potential, the potential, this is not by any means a guarantee they would have to win election two times, and actually three times, <laughs> 2022, 2024, and 2028, uh, they could serve a total of 10 years, right? So the incumbent that we're talking about is someone who is currently not in office. Uh, it's not, it's not Mayor Licardo. It would be whoever wins uh, in 2022 and is in office at that time in 2024. There was a concern about the concept of the provisional ballot. So somebody could run provisionally. Um, so in 2022, um, and if the legislation passes, if the amendment passes, um, then that person would, could in theory be an incumbent mayor because they ran provisionally. That's why I, Mark, uh, the city attorney and I had had this discussion. That's why I thought it would really just make it much more clear. So now we're not into provisional, provisional candidates. Um, if you could just somehow include or exclude the current mayor, either way. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you have any advice for us on, on that, um, whether it, there's legal language that could be used to clarify that. Well, I, I think your specification or your clarification is sufficient in the way that I had envisioned drafting this would would be that uh, setup where whoever was the candidate who won in 2024, they would be considered the incumbent. We would make that very clear that the person who um, holding the office of mayor as the incumbent whose term began January 1st, 2023, that would be the person who would be eligible to run for an additional successive four-year terms. If somebody were to give the current mayor, whether or not he wanted it, an opportunity to run again, the ballot measure would have to create some sort of mechanism for him to even qualify for the ballot uh, because he can't functionally qualify for the ballot under the current charter rules because he is, he is termed out. Now, one thing to be clear, this is a little, just, I don't wanna confuse any issues, but because the charter's term limits are two successive four-year terms, if Mayor Licardo so wanted to run in 2024, he certainly could because he, there would be a break in his um, uh, terms and the, it would be like a reset. So, so he could run again and, and we can't prevent him from doing that. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mark, would you be able to repeat just that last part about the break? So in, in the city of San Jose, the way our term limits work is it prohibits two successive four-year terms. Um, but council members who have a break 
uh, can run again and serve uh, another four-year term so long as it's not successive uh, to their previous term. So I just wanted to clarify that we couldn't prevent Mayor Licardo from running in 2024 uh, if he so wanted to because he would be out of office and he would be running for a new four-year term in 2024. Okay, so so you're just saying that generally speaking, when you're talking about term limits, that's just prevent the it just limits successive terms. It doesn't limit non-successive terms. That's correct. I don't. I believe we've had a council member appointed uh, again after having run, and I know some council members, former council members, have run as candidates. I can't recall off my top of my head if we've had repeat uh, people who've gone away and then come back, uh, but it is possible under our charter. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions from commissioners. Um, so I will move to public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to address this item? First speaker is Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto. Um, my concern is language that is being used or there's a particular document in these supplemental um, reports that it's centering some kind of standard that Somos Mayfair had come up with. And that the standard is being applied like a template to different policy measures. Okay, now we, we have to really like, you know, you know, talk about this. Is Somos Mayfair a, a non-elected political arm that is influencing the context in which people function and live here in San Jose that is getting like millions of dollars of grant money funneled to them? Or are they really just a nonprofit? Because the 501c3, to qualify for it, you cannot participate in political processes. You, you, you can't do it. And so, but yet, they are openly being acknowledged as a document that they produced has been used as a template. So, I mean, this is, it, it's the kind of corruption that's going on with the relationships that, that these nonprofits are having with the politicians, look at what happened with Jeff. Jeff brings up that issue with the with the voting, with the uh, with the uh, pu pushing this thing along. Yeah, the votes are already there, so we ain't got to talk about it no more. That is a circumvention of the democratic process, right there. Then um, uh, Commissioner Matsumoto brings it up, and then uh, Commissioner Callender brings it up, and then the Senora. It was somebody, a woman's voice. She, uh, uh, Commissioner Callender wasn't saying nothing. But then she is the one that suggested, oh, so you're suggesting a motion? He didn't say nothing. That was a leading question. It was not a part of the conversation. It was still under discussion. But when the other commissioners stuck in and suggested and asked it in a form of a question, it's called the leading question. And so now it becomes, and then it, boom, and then you guys passed it. We didn't get to comment on that. We did not have public comment on that particular issue. Sorry, I closed the participant list. Um, Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you. Wait, did that work? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, what happened? Can you go. hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. It says zero seconds, so I don't. Oh, there you go. Thank you, sweetie. All right, good. So, yeah, I, I definitely feel that the subcommittee, from the little I'm learning about it, it should be open and that. Um, uh, Tony Tabor said, oh, well, I haven't been into any subcommittees that were open to the public. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, her, 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 uh, you know, choice of where she's working, whatever, you know, conservative cities that she might have worked in does not mean that it shouldn't be. And that's where Berkeley is doing it. Berkeley does, um, it's open their subcommittees and we should follow them. And so, you know, that's, uh, that's really important. The subcommittees because you know, there's so much uh, information that is more you can be exposed to things and see what's really going on behind the scenes, who's making the decisions, what the problems are, because this is a deciding body. Uh, I mean, not deciding because the council makes the final decision, but it's the recommended body. And so, you know, I think it's very important, you know, to um, have the subcommittees open to the public. And that that's definitely um, my, my comment on, especially these very, um, very important critical issues that are for the people um, are so critical. And then, you know, that we need, you know, 
um, just more forums to hear the information and to see, you know, to have the curtain pulled, you know, behind it so that we really, it, it is open government and that that's very important. So, um, so that needs to change right away because we're making these decisions and, um, you know, as much um, data as we can have, the better. So I'd really like that to be changed. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to have our subcommittees open to the public. And so that's um, one issue that will, you know, bring more light to these uh, very critical issues that we're dealing with. So that's my comment about the subcommittees. Thank you very much. Caller 5140. Yeah, we, we don't need a strong mayor. Uh, Sam Licardo is bad enough. I mean, he's a gun grabber. He wants to just show papers now to get into a, 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 a enclosed event. Next is going to be bars and restaurants. Before you know, it's going to be the grocery store. This guy wants you to probably wear a mask and be vaccinated and sit in your house for the rest of your life. We don't need a strong mayor. He he's he's a weak mayor and he does horrible things. I mean, you ever tried driving around these bike lanes? These are because of him. Road diets because of him. He makes a lot of stupid decisions, and we don't need a strong mayor. I used to think that a city manager government was bad. It's not good. Uh, I think there's other forms that are better, but this guy, Ricardo, I mean, he he was trying to jockey to make it so he could be uh, go, you know mayor for a while. And uh, yeah, this whole thing, the change the off year for voting because some people that hey, if you don't want to turn out to vote don't you know it, it's that it's that group of people or that person's fault why they don't show up in off elections it's not my problem uh keep it the way it is keep the mayor the way it is if we if, like i say if, if, May, if mayor Licardo was any stronger he'd have me arrested so in these committees i don't know if they're if they're much good of anything because in the end, the corporate interests override everybody. San Jose City Council, I mean, they, they should just call themselves a real estate office. That's what they are. They dictate the, how the real estate terms are going to be uh, in the city. And quite frankly, they have too much power. They, 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 they really do. And uh, they always fold when the decisions get hard. But, man, they're not, they're not afraid to tell you that your flagpole has to be a certain height or you know, Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for Tessa's words about how the subcommittee process can be a, a more open public process. There should be good Brown Act rules that can allow us to interpret uh, the subcommittee process as we would like it to be as an open space. Um, and thank you for her words about Berkeley. I think that's fairly accurate. Um, I. You know, the first speaker tonight, um, he, he, in all his great hour long talk, uh, he also talked about what do we want to expect of ourselves in the next five years, in the next 10 years of ourselves? What, what are we doing this for? I think we have to make an effort to make the, that kind of stuff open and available and understandable to people. We don't do that enough anymore, I don't think. And I think it's a really interesting way to work. I think it offers kind of a, a image and, and pictures and ideas and ideals of what uh, we can expect of ourselves. And I think that's the good stuff. And that's the stuff that people really need at this time. We all need that hope and idealism of what reimagine and equity and open democratic practices can offer, which is what uh, you guys were, were voting on a few minutes ago that I question should you have possibly had public comment uh, before voting on that issue something to consider. It's really important. And what you're deciding for 2024 is tip the mayor election. There's going to be a lot, a lot of money involved at that time. Uh, exorbitant amounts of new money. We got to really consider, you know, if we're going to do this good practices, what the next step after voting for this is how do we learn to vote everyday people into office? How can they have a chance to be voted into office and, and to run for office? in San Jose. That has to be the other part of this new measure you're bringing to the council soon. What are we going to do about our future? Thank you. Back to the commission. Hey, thank you. Um, oh, uh, wait, and, uh, did Paul Soto already speak? 
He did. He's he's raising his hand for the next item. Sorry. Um, now we're moving to public comment open forum. This is the time for public comment items that are not on the agenda. The Brown Act prohibits the commission from discussing any item that is not agendized. Each speaker will be given two minutes. Can the clerk please call the public speaker? Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto. I'd really, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you on that one, Tony. And I would like you to go back and review it. And the order was, is that we spoke after Jeff spoke, okay? Because all these people have orders, and they got marching orders, okay? Because the the way that this was coordinated and the way it went down, soon that Tran already had the thing. Oh, so how do we draft the language? And you know, I mean, you can't, that was a planned hit job. So Jeff was the one that spoke first. He's the one that suggested it. And then public comment was closed on those issues. Then Matsumura brought it up. Hey, uh, you know, what, what you know, can we do this? And so what the what, what Lawrence did is he said, you know what, we'll, we'll go ahead. We'll, we'll, we might discuss it at the end if we have some time. But he intentionally made time for it. Like it was an agendized item or something. And it is not. And because of that, there was a deprivation, and, and I think uh, Commissioner uh, Callender, because he caught it. He caught it, okay? And what that tells me is that there is a consciousness of guilt. There is a consciousness that what you guys are doing is corrupt. You are circumventing democracy. You have, you have contacts, direct contacts, South Bay Labor Council, all of the nonprofits, Councilman uh, uh, Carrasco, Esparza, Perales, and the Coro. These are the relationships that are being corrupted. And the reason why I stay at all these meetings all the time is in honor of all of the Chicano lives that were lost in those fields in Sasi Puedes when they had the pesticides sprayed on them. It is an honor for me to stay on these calls the whole time and give critical thought to what it is that's going on in this city because you have 400,000 people that are gonna be coming to San Jose and they're planning for it, which means all the infrastructure that's being built now is for people that aren't even here yet, but you're, you're taking. Tessa Wood, Matsy. Oh, good. Well, um, the biggest issue we face is our climate crisis and we need to have it in the charter. That's, that's definitely important. And I was thinking about the mayor, and I was thinking about when they were talking about 2022, which Deb Davis, Republican value Deb Davis, is running. And so, you know, we could get her, and, you know, then she could be a mayor, like, you know, like happened to Pierre Luigi or whatever, and he was a mayor, a council member for 10 years. And when you make these changes, it could be very detrimental to our democracy because it's, it's not unusual, as we all know, that the incumbent wins because people just name recognition. So th these are the critical, that is a critical issue because these are such critical years that we need to not be changing. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the elections where we could potentially have somebody in for 10 years because of the critical um, steps that we need to be taking aggressively to bring our fossil fuel emissions and our cement emissions and down to zero. And the cement has a lot of CO2. It's, if it was a country, it'd be the third largest emitter of CO2. And so, you know, that's building high rises. And all these, you know, the, another whole topic of building offices. You know, we need to build housing. We need to be dealing with our cross crises. And so anyway, getting back to the commission, that, that is something to really, why we wouldn't want to change the mayoral election because of the criticalness of the years that are coming up where all it's going to be about is about our, how we're going to deal with climate crisis. And we really need a very forward thinking, you know, uh, person who is willing to um, make the deep cuts that need to happen that isn't business, business friendly, because we can't be doing business as usual. We need to be doing transformational changes and bringing us back to our basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. And the three things they say is no driving, no flying, and no movement of goods. Caller 5140. Uh, there, 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 there's no turning back. You can't polish a turd. That's what this town is. It's a turd. There's no polishing. And all, all they're, it's just a real estate board, the city council and San Macar. They're just, they're, all they're trying to do is maximize taxation and fees and kickbacks and everything else. I mean, and just look at this city. It looks terrible. 
shabby, bad potholes, uh, burned out buildings. But there's no shortage of cops waiting on a corner, hiding behind a bush, you know, with, with a radar gun, right? They're good at that. Right, they're good at, at 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 tyrannical laws like the one they want to pass tomorrow to make you show a vaccine card to get into buildings. It's just, I mean, police force fire them all. They're terrible. All they're do, it's a they're a bunch of snooty, snobby cops that are going to be millionaires if they're not already with their high salaries, living in their million dollar Morgan Hill mansions. This is what we're paying for. And I mean, look at this town. I mean, look at it. I mean, could you imagine people visiting here? They, they must think, oh, my God, what is this place? It's terrible. It's mini San Francisco, broken out windows, shit on the streets. It's just terrible. This, this, this city, this city need, needs new management, new everything. Blair Beekman? Hi, thanks for a real informational meeting tonight. Um, yeah, to quickly offer, uh, you know, I'm for uh, the uh, election process being moved to 2024, but you really got to have uh, some guidelines and, and good practices towards what the future of the election process in San Jose can be and how the everyday community can really take part in it and, and what sort of you know new practices can develop out of that. I, it has to be hopefully a part of this uh, approval process that you're bringing to the council coming up. Um, you are thinking about it, so I hope you can continue those efforts. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, you know, Aaron Zisser, I mean, he just really proved tonight, he was third uh, after two other previous IPAs to really set up a really good concept but they were a bit uh, on the government side and bureaucratic and, and strong with that position. Aaron's sisters really seemed like the guy who, who could really walk us through the good practices of the first previous two IPAs and, and, and make it a more community effort. I think we really have got to consider open democracy in the next decade as, a, as our hopeful cause and ideas of, of how to consider oversight and how to consider community practices in our future. It's not just equity. It's not just reimagined as important, as great as they can be. It's also open democracy that can provide, you know, civil rights ideas, civil protection ideas, oversight for government. So we don't go through this COVID stuff. So we don't go through the 9-11 stuff again. The community is coming on strong. Let's figure out ways of good democracy. Let's really practice that stuff. It's not just the democracy of a republic anymore. We're learning the ideas of individual democracy, or the democracy of the individual. Good luck how we can do that, and that's your task before you. Uh, thank you. Back to the commission. Thank you. Um, next, we have a meeting schedule and agenda item. I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the public hearing previously scheduled for August 25th has now been canceled. The next Charter Review Commission meeting will be a study session on September 9th at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. Um, and with that, the meeting of the Charter Review Commission is now adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone.